Lighting in the Dark, Fay Wild Series, Book 6, written by W.J. May, narrated by Kathleen Star Hall. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. There may be no place like home, but sometimes it can be bloody hard getting there. Gilly has been trying to get back to her realm for ages, but too many obstacles stand in her way. She's finally made it to a fey realm, just not the right fey realm. And now she's tasked with not only freeing the part-time monster who is slowly working his way into her heart, but also escaping a prophecy that says she's mixed up in the coming apocalypse. If that weren't enough, vampires, a spider-herding sorceress, and an evil prince are all out for her blood. Can she survive it all with the web intact? Or will she usher in the great annihilation that buries the multiverse in eternal darkness? Prologue Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? His father's reply filled his stomach with bile. There has never been anything more beautiful. The renowned warrior and respected ruler leaned over the crib and made a ridiculous face at the creature lying inside it. At the creature's cooing response, he broke into a smile so wide it took over half his face. He rolled his eyes and turned away, then slunk into the hallway. Letting the door close behind him, he composed himself, remembering his place in a world that had suddenly tilted on its side. Why had they insisted on another child? At their age, it's ludicrous. His infant sister had appeared at a very inopportune moment. Once assured of his parents' unending devotion in the way only a single child could be, he was now coping with the arrival of a spotlight-stealing brat. It was a weight on his shoulders that his twenty-some years of cuddling and unconditional love had not prepared him for. He straightened and brushed agitated hands down his embroidered tunic, pulling himself together. It wouldn't do for one of the palace staff to see their crown prince in a snit. One of the few lessons his father had managed to sink into his skull was the importance of a man's reputation. Powerful men don't throw tantrums, his father had been fond of telling him during his terrible toddler years. Powerful men control others by controlling their own emotions. If features schooled, he set off down the hallway at a sedate pace, being sure to give no evidence of the seething mass of anger stewing below the surface. I need an outlet for this rage. Maybe a vigorous combat practice with the palace guards would suffice. Or a willing serving wench could tend to my passions. His mind turning to more pleasant thoughts, he rounded the corner and caught sight of a demurely dressed female passing across the corridor before him. He'd seen her before. He talked to her at state functions when she'd been introduced. Her face was plain, her mannerisms a little odd, but her talents were unquestionable. She's a seer, one whose visions always come true, the only one in a generation who can prophesize. Although she was young, her name was already well known around the realm, and he knew she would prove a valuable asset to any ruler who wasn't fond of surprises. The seer looked in his direction and blushed, then hurried on, almost tripping over her skirts and bumping into a table holding an ornate vase. Hurrying forward, he managed to catch the wobbling object before it hit the floor and shattered. She stood there, frozen, eyes wide, hand to mouth. My apologies, your highness, she said in a breathy, halting voice. I'm afraid I've always been the clumsy sort. I'm glad you are here to keep me from making a ruin of the palace hallway. His smile was friendly as he straightened the vase and turned to her. Nonsense! You could never ruin anything! Stepping forward, he collected her hand and lifted it to his mouth, bending over to kiss the back of it. In fact, your radiance improves any location you grace with your presence. Her face turned a shade of red he found unflattering, but he trained his expression to one of besotted devotion. One never knows when a woman might come in handy, he told himself. And no woman can resist a handsome prince. Stroll with me in the gardens, he asked suddenly, his tone entreating. Her smile slipped. I've been summoned by High Mage, she told him softly. She would be less than pleased to learn I did not come directly to her. Let me handle the High Mage, he said with a wink. She's a good friend of my mother. Tucking her arm in his, he led her in the direction of the courtyard that led to the royal gardens. He could feel her trembling with nervousness about the High Mage's disappointment, perhaps. Or perhaps she's excited to be next to me. He was used to the adoration of others, his charm, 
his attractive form, and his place as the heir to the realm were a potent combination he knew, and the prince was not one to ignore such obvious advantages. Although he wouldn't go as far as to admit it, his status and the reaction it caused animated him, brought him pleasure. It was addictive, this feeling, the near worship his subjects had for him. It seems almost a waste of time, he said in a wistful tone, and she looked at him, alarm on her plain features. A waste? What do you mean? He paused to let her agitation build before relieving it with a suave line. Because none of the flowers in my mother's garden can even come close to your own beauty. She simpered, and he held back his annoyance. Women like this young seer were too eager. There wasn't any challenge in the seduction. Reminding himself of her usefulness, he moved closer to her, knowing it would make her heart beat harder. Tell me, my lovely one, have you seen anything interesting in your visions lately? His casual tone did not reflect the depth of interest he had in the question. He'd never expected any competition for his parents' affections, and given how infatuated they were with that brat, he knew it was just a matter of time before the creature was stealing the attention of his loyal subjects as well. If she knows something, anything, about that crying, cooing thing, then I want to know it too. Her face screwed up as she considered his question. There was something interesting, confusing even. She gave him an undignified look, bunching her shoulders and giggling. I haven't even told the high mage about it yet. Go on, he said, his interest engaged. There was a woman of beauty and strength. Like us, but not. Nose wrinkled, gaze far away, her voice softened. In a thick forest, in the deep of night, a force stalks her, making demands. I see myself then, like the sunrise, like salvation. And the funniest thing was, she didn't even have a... That is strange, he interrupted, made impatient by the lack of his own part in the nonsensical vision she was narrating. But it makes me wonder if perhaps you've seen anything meaningful about my own future. I will be the ruler of the realm one day, after all. Surely there is something noteworthy about me in your visions. As she considered his words, brushing a lock of frizzy white blonde hair from her face. I can't say that I've seen anything related to you, your highness, she admitted. Although images do swirl around your infant sister. I fear the poor dear is in for an interesting life. That's so. His disappointment nearly swallowed the polite persona he was clinging to. That horrible little pest stealing my thunder. The knowledge that fate had something in store for the creature solidified the hatred he felt toward the infant. Then again, maybe I can use that to my advantage. He led her through the archway and into the courtyard where a large stone fountain stood. A statue of a female in a gauzy gown pouring water from a large jug, contributing to the peaceful atmosphere. The fountain served as the entrance to the gardens, a stone path taking them between tall, carefully manicured hedges that flowered with small pink blooms. Deeper they went until they were entirely alone in the fragrant oasis. He led her to a stone bench surrounded by blooms with a small pond nearby, the sound of trickling water combining with birdsong to create a pleasant soundtrack in contrast to the conversation he planned to start. These images you see relating to my sister, he started, his hand taking hers as he leaned in intently. Is there anything dangerous among them? She stared into his eyes, distracted by his handsome features. Dangerous? He nodded, cupping her face and stroking her cheek with his thumb. Something that might represent a risk to the realm. The seer bit her lip, her eyes filling with arousal at their closeness. Although he appreciated the response he invoked in females, this one did little to kindle his own urges. Releasing his hold on her so as not to distract her further, he waited patiently for an answer. He watched as she tucked a lock of hair behind her ears and let out a deep breath. It's difficult to say if something will turn out dangerous or not, I can scarcely interpret the symbols, I see, let alone guess what the future holds for our little princess. He detested the sweet smile gracing her face as she thought about the creature that had so captivated his parents, but he managed to mask his revulsion. 
I guess only time will tell if there would be a risk to the realm in what I've seen, she finished with a shrug. Disappointment flooded him, but he refused to allow her to see it. That is good to hear, I suppose. The seer might seem useless now, but, as she said, only time would tell. She might end up providing the catalyst he needed to see that the little pest would not be allowed to upset his plans. Enough about my sister, he said, changing the subject. Where did you get such a handsome scarf? You like it? She beamed, holding out the monstrosity for his admiration. The colorful scarf was the tackiest thing he'd seen in the palace he'd grown up in. It's like a rainbow threw up and she sees fit to wind it around her neck. I knitted it myself. Enchanting. He was already weary of spending time in the woman's presence, so he stood taking her hand. Although it pains me to say it, I've promised to assist my mother this afternoon while she ministers to the less fortunate among us. He leaned over to press another kiss to the back of her hand. I hope we will meet again soon. My heart will not beat the same until we do. Oh, your highness, she simpered, letting out a high-pitched giggle that offended his sensitive ears. I will count the hours. He stood, made an elegant bow, then turned away, heading deeper into the garden toward a small door in the wall that led back into the palace. Frustrated by the seer's lack of concrete knowledge, he thought briefly about stealing the infant away and passing her off to a loyal guard to deposit somewhere in the rough. However, the risk was too great as he couldn't have word of his deeds get back to his parents. Not if I want to remain their heir. I'll find some way to banish the Brett, he told himself, before she's able to win over the hearts and minds of my people. This kingdom is rightfully mine, and I'll be damned if I let an idiotic infant take it away from me. Sliding through the doorway and into one of the narrow passageways frequented by the palace staff, he found himself headed toward his favorite serving wench, a sturdy girl who was almost as lusty as he was. It would be a palate cleanse after the plainness of the seer, and she would help rid him of the foul temper now plaguing him. I'll bless the girl with my royal presence, then figure out a way to get rid of my annoying little sister later. After all, time is on my side. The little creature can't even speak yet. By the time she's old enough to matter, I'll have turned the realm against her. With an evil chuckle, the prince continued down the hallway and deeper into the bowels of the palace. Chapter 1 I might have considered once or twice how it would feel to know that an apocalypse was coming, but I never thought that I'd be the one who'd herald the end of everything. Gilly's face sank into her hands as she struggled to come to grips with what she'd just seen. The temple complex was quiet around her, the fae that had led her here, having crept into the night, his wings stiff, leaving her alone to contemplate. Gilly sat on the marble steps, out of the circle of light from the burning braziers, and wondered how events had led her to this place. Her mother is at the center of all this, she thought. Just like she'll apparently be at the center of the whirlwind that destroys the multiverse as we know it. Elspeth, queen of the Fae, and creator of her home realm, hadn't been what one would call a model mother. Still, despite her stifled resentments, Gilly could understand why her mother had made the choices she had in her misplaced battle against her consort liar. But no one could justify bringing about the apocalypse. No matter how much Gilly wanted to adore her mother, she wiped at tears that couldn't seem to stop flowing. She'd always been one to downplay her emotions, to shove them into a hole inside herself and ignore them to get the job done. The crone had pushed her when she was younger, pushed her to be strong and put her duty first. She'd kept these same traits as leader of the wildling forces and in her service to the winking hand, the fighting force comprised of the wilding fae's strongest magic users. But she wasn't able to control her feelings anymore. The exhaustion of her kidnapping and escape attempts overwhelming her general stoicism. How long can I be expected to keep moving, to keep fighting? To find my way home in the face of insurmountable odds? How can I succeed when it seems everyone and now everything is against me? That may be for good reason. She was thinking peacefully about the role she was supposed to play in bringing about the great annihilation, the destruction of everything good in the multiverse she and uncountable others called home. 
At that moment, the image of Solomon popped into her head, and she remembered how she'd forced him to obey her commands by placing a silver ring on the dove's finger. Solomon hadn't exactly played fair with her either, but that didn't assuage the guilt she felt at controlling his actions, both back on Aramanabad, the dev's home realm, or here in the Fey realm of Valencia. It's my fault he's here. If I had released him sooner instead of pressing him to stay with me, he wouldn't be imprisoned and about to be executed by a realm full of vengeful Fey. The sobs wrecked her and Gilly felt weak. Although a sentence had not yet been passed on Solomon, she wasn't holding out much hope for a different verdict, and now the dev's only advocate was tied up in the destruction of this world and who knew how many others. It's not like the Fae are going to appreciate my defending him, even if I am one of their own. I'm just as tainted as he is now. Are you planning on spending the night here? A voice called to her. Gilly smeared away her tears and blinked bleary-eyed to see Phaedra coming down the path toward the temple. Even in the dim of night, the Fae was a magnificent sight, her gold-tinged wings glowing in the moonlight. When Gilly had learned that the other races had myths about winged fairy folk, she'd idly wondered what it might feel like to have gossamer wings that let her glide from tree to tree. But her athleticism already allowed that, so she decided wings were an unnecessary appendage. Then, in the realm of dreams, when she discovered glimmering wings on her own back, she'd been filled with glee. That memory felt very far away now while Gilly wallowed in the misery of her foreknowledge of the future engendered. Why bother to go anywhere, she muttered. It's a waste of energy. Every place I've ended up has revealed an even more terrifying fate. I'll just stay here and rot, thank you. Hands on her hips. Phaedra stared at her for a moment, then burst into laughter. <laughs> I thought you had more grit than that. You might be a youngin, but you've impressed me with your skill and spirit. You put silver to a dev. I could not point to many who could pull off such a feat, and none are as young as you. And here you are, crying about the end of the world. Gilly's mouth screwed up, and she let out a burst of frustrated air. No wonder they call you Phaedra the Relentless. Are you saying I shouldn't be mourning the end of the multiverse? The older fay rolled her eyes. This ain't my first apocalypse, babe, and it damn sure won't be my last. So pick yourself up and get down to the hard work of averting whatever catastrophe is waiting in the wings. She held up a finger. But first, how about you get some rest? You look like hellspawn at the moment. Gee, I wonder why that is. Gilly grumbled, but she stood, stretching muscles that had grown numb during her sojourn with self-pity. Maybe it was being dragged all over a hell realm for days on end. When she reached Phaedra, the Fae put an arm and a wing around her. I know things don't seem so great at the moment, but you'll feel better after a good night's sleep. Gilly didn't answer. They walked through the Fae city, the darkness driven away by lights burning at intervals along the paths and walkways. Some were torches, candles, and lamps, while others were set alight by magical means. The mixture of stone-crafted buildings and natural landscape, accented by both natural and unnatural lighting, made her wonder whether their own realm could resemble Valencia. If my mother and her consort hadn't been set at odds so long ago, perhaps our realm would be more like this one. The Fey realm that Gilly called home was much more polarized. Those who'd chosen to dwell in the cities had eschewed the wild forest she'd called home. These metropolises made of stone had fewer natural elements than Valencia's cities seemed to, and those who dwelt in them were fearful of the Fey wilds and unbridled nature. At the same time, wildlings like Gilly avoided the stone dwellers, seeing them as inferior and responsible for the destruction of the verdant forests that the wildlings called home. Here the winged fae had not formed factions, and they seemed content living in their melded cities of both stone and leaf. Gilly felt a little pang of regret over what her realm could have been. Had Rashan and Willard not decided to meddle there and set the realm on a course of war and hatred for millennia, this one's mine, 
Phaedra said, jerking her chin, at what looked like to be a living lilac bush that towered above them. It took her a moment to realize a slender wooden door was tucked among the purple blossoms. Her hostess held the door for her and Gilly stepped inside, her skin warming instantly at the heat of the fire roaring on the hearth. Two comfortable chairs faced the fireplace, and tucked beside it was what appeared to be a small makeshift kitchen with an assembly of crockery that looked as if it was seldom used. On the opposite side of the small wood-paneled room was a narrow sofa occupied by a sleepy-eyed human who waved cheerfully at her. "'You found her!' Holly said in a warm voice. She was tucked beneath a quilt, having turned the sofa into a makeshift bed. "'I'm sure you'll be much more comfortable sleeping here than outdoors,' she said, then yawned heavily. Gilly nodded, then followed Phaedra up a narrow set of stairs that looked like they were somewhat composed of the bush's root system. "'Bedroom's up here,' the elder face said over her shoulder. "'It's small, but functional enough.' The room turned out to be about one hundred square feet, with only a bed large enough for one, a dresser with a basin atop it, and a small half-empty closet. "'You take the bed,' Phaedra said, gesturing toward it. "'Then where will you sleep?' she asked, confused. I rarely sleep in beds now. I've gotten too used to sleeping rough. Phaedra plucked a blanket from the top of her closet and tossed it onto the floor. I'll be fine down here. Gilly sat on the bed and watched the other face sink to the floor, her wings curling around her in a sort of cocoon. Felt pricked at her for taking Phaedra's bed, but the Fae didn't seem to mind, and exhaustion caused her eyes to close. She settled into the bed, and moments later sleep claimed her. It was not a dreamless sleep. Thoughts of Solomon still swirled in her unconscious, it seemed, and before Gilly realized it, she found herself standing on a sand dune. A darkly handsome figure stood a few paces before her, looking to the distance where a deep forest stretched for as far as the eye could see. She approached the familiar figure, stopping beside him. Solomon turned to her, his face sad. I don't belong here, do I? he asked, motioning to the forest. Gilly didn't know how to answer his question, but it turned out to be th rhetorical. I may not belong there, but I am going to die there. There was such finality in his tone that her heart ached for him. You can't say that for certain, she told him, shaking her head. You've been up against horrible odds before. These fey will not hesitate to spill my blood, he said his tone turning vicious and filling with hatred. Let's not forget you were planning to sell not one but two fey into slavery, then showed up unexpectedly in their realm. You can't blame them for being frightened of someone they've considered an enemy for eons. His face screwed up with anger. So, you want to punish me too? Is that it? Your friend dragged me into this realm. I didn't come here willingly. Gilly held up her hands in a gesture of surrender. I don't want to punish you, and I'm not trying to justify their actions. I'm only trying to get you to see it from another perspective. I'm not saying that perspective is right, but if you don't calm down, we'll never find a way out of this situation. We! Haven't you gotten everything you wanted? You're free of the Hell Realm. You're among allies. What's to stop you from walking away now? His expression was neutral, but Gilly could tell the question held emotional weight. Because I'm not some soulless acorn hoarder, that's why. I feel somewhat responsible for your current circumstances, so I won't leave you to rot, or worse. Gilly's sigh was heavy. <laughs> Just try to calm down and use some of that charm of yours. You might avoid bloodshed if you do. Solomon turned to her, looking her over with new eyes. What's with these? he asked, then touched a finger to the tip of her wings. She shivered at the contact, then realized she was dreaming. I must have fallen into his dream because I was thinking of him earlier. When she didn't answer, he asked another question. You think I'm charming? Sometimes. You can be a handsome, persuasive devil when you try. Solomon smiled in response. I'm not a devil. I'm a dev. He leaned in, pressing his lips against hers. Soft at first, then the pressure increased, and her muscles turned to liquid. He wrapped his strong arms around her, deepening the kiss until her toes curled. It was a sultry, slow build of a kiss, 
and Gilly was caught off guard by the surging swell of heat inside her. She clung to him, taking everything he gave her and wanting more. A fate could get used to this, she thought, winding her arms around his neck. Hopes for a future with the dev at her side filled her, shocking her rational mind back to the present. Gilly woke up suddenly with a gasp, clutching her chest. The Phaedra's head poked over the edge of the bed suddenly. You okay? Not at all, Gilly gave a nod, her voice hoarse. Just a nightmare. Phaedra nodded and returned to her bed on the floor, while Gilly felt embarrassment flood her. It was a nightmare, she told herself. Isn't that what a dream you can never have really is? Chapter 2 Salma was waiting for her the next morning with an insufferable smirk on his face. I wondered if you'd show up here today, or if you'd lack the courage to face me. She'd been prepared for this reaction. Having figured out she was in his dream, Gilly knew he wouldn't be able to keep silent about their intimate interaction. She was the one who didn't want to engage on that particular topic, so she ignored his opening salvo. How is it here? she asked, peering into the cell he occupied. Your accommodations could be worse. Filigree bars of shiny silver stood between them. Behind the bars was a compact chamber with a woven mat and ornamental pillows, a cushioned chair to a small writing desk, and a chamber pot tucked discreetly in the corner. Solomon seemed less than interested in her observations about his prison cell. Not eager to talk about what happened in your dream last night? It wasn't my dream, she replied before she could stop herself. The moment the words left her lips, she regretted them. Are you sure, he said with a teasing grin. From your reaction, I assumed it was yours. This is how you want to spend your time, wasting it talking about inconsequential matters. The irritation was plain in her voice. Inconsequential? That isn't the word I would choose to describe what happened last night. His voice dropped, his eyes filling with heat. Impassioned, enthusiastic, hot-blooded. His eyebrow quirked in time with the last one. Those would provide a more accurate description. Asanine, she muttered under her breath. That's the description that fits you right now. At his laugh, she continued. Besides, everyone knows what happens in a dream isn't real. His gaze burned her, and his tone was sultry. Oh, it was very real, Mujisa. And if you hadn't chickened out and disappeared last night, I would have shown you how real it can get. Gilly fanned herself, then froze not wanting him to see what effect his words had on her. Rolling her eyes dramatically, she changed the subject once more, refusing to discuss hypotheticals, when a very real danger hung over his head. How are you going to get out of this? she asked seriously. The sooner you get off this world, the better your chances of survival are. His smile faded. Solomon let out a breath and seemed to diminish, making her heart ache. I can't argue with you there. Let me know if you have any ideas. He turned his back on her, stepping onto the mat and sitting down, his legs bent in front of him. Her brow furrowed. Can't you use your magical sand powers? She asked, twirling her finger to imitate the whirlwind of sand that enabled him to travel more quickly and, in certain circumstances, to teleport. It isn't that simple, he replied. I could only use my powers to teleport to my family's estate, and since I've now given up its claim to Mace, I no longer possess that power. He's the guardian of Deep Sands now. The magnitude of his actions on Aramana Bard reverberated through her, now that she realized the sacrifice he'd made when giving up his claim to the family estate. You have no more powers? she asked, her voice coming out as barely more than a whisper. My innate dev powers remain, he said stiffly pride making him lift his head. I can still transform into my more powerful form, cause nightmares and other smaller magics. I am not as helpless as you might think. She nodded relieved. You're not the helpless type. That made him grin. Still, I'm no match for a full fake court and their minions. The fae are a formidable race, as you know yourself. More than a match for a single dev. Gilly approached the bars working her fingers through them and holding on tight. She wanted to tell him it wasn't just him against the world, that she had his back, no matter what perils he faced, but the words wouldn't come out. Can I really go against this race of fae? 
they may not be from my realm, but there is a connection, one that cannot be disputed. My family is somehow tied to the people of Valentia, even if I don't know how yet. Can I make him this promise, when it might mean risking my chance to find out about the prophecy and my role in it? Before she had a chance to answer her own question, she was joined by Phaedra, who had accompanied her to the ornate prison earlier. Phaedra had sweet-talked the guards into letting Gilly visit their most notorious charge. The face seemed on good terms with most of the guards, and Gilly hadn't missed the admiration on their faces. Phaedra commanded their respect, and Gilly appreciated her using her cash to gain access to Solomon. It's really the least she could do, she thought, anger pricking her yet again. She should have left well enough alone and not dragged Solomon here. He'd be safe on Araman, and I'd be on my way home. Even as she thought those things, she realized they weren't exactly the way she felt. She didn't want Solomon to be facing an epic-level punishment, but the self-interested part of herself was relieved that he was here with her, especially in the face of what she'd learned about the potential apocalypse she was staring down. Just having him here made her feel better, even though she was being selfish. Is my time up already? Gilly's fingers tightened, and she gauged her chances of keeping a grip if the other Fae decided to try to drag her out. His is, Phaedra replied, motioning toward the dev. Don't make a fuss now. Wait, Gilly said, turning around and stretching her arms against the bars to block them with her body. What are you saying? You're going to execute him now? Phaedra paused, then let out a giggle. I realize now the finality of what I just said. I only meant he's been summoned by the council. Speaking past Gilly, she addressed the dev. Come along quickly, and we won't have any problems. Solomon stood, but Gilly wasn't ready to move out of Phaedra's way. What does the council want with him? What's going to happen to him? I'm not a member of the council, so I really couldn't tell you. There was a note of irritation in her voice. But I've been around for a long time, longer than most, and I've never seen anyone executed at a council session. So you can stand aside, or I'll call in my friends who are standing guard in the hall. Gilly swallowed and stepped aside to allow Phaedra to open the door with the golden key she'd borrowed from the guards. Solomon approached, the silver chains around his arms flashing in the light. Lead the way. The Fey warriors stationed in the hall had to be the beefiest males in the realm. Their eyes were fastened on Solomon, and they fell in line behind Gilly, bringing up the rear of their small group. Gilly's emotions were a seething storm inside her. The uncertainty Solomon faced in addition to the revelation of the prophecy made things impossible to predict. She, she was out of her depth, and the community member on her side was the same one who created this mess for her. Phaedra was friendly, knowledgeable, and determined. Those were traits she admired in any being, especially a fae female. In normal circumstances, she might want to emulate Phaedra, but the fact that she wanted to see Solomon punished had soured any potential affection she might feel for the woman. I can't trust her, and trust is what I need right now. They exited the citadel, and Gilly expected to breathe a little easier, but the atmosphere remained oppressive and her anxiety rose with each step that brought her closer to the Fay Council and their judgment. She could see the amphitheater rising above the trees, and something inside her collapsed under the weight of woe pressing upon her. The guards kept their eyes on the prisoner, as did most everyone in the streets that they passed. Some whispered, some stared in shock, and others hurled angry insults at the dev. Solomon's face was like stone, his eyes staring straight ahead. She hoped his mind could block out the horrid things people said to him, but Gilly knew him well enough to understand he was more vulnerable to abuse than he might let on. He's strong, she told herself. He'll come through this. At least it's only insults they're tossing and not spears. But deep inside she knew he'd be struggling. After learning about his childhood and the trauma he suffered at the hands of his brother on the family estate and all the pain and suffering that followed, she was surprised Solomon was capable of compassion at all. But he is capable of that emotion, and so much more. Empathy, courage, understanding, love. Gilly shook the thoughts from her brain like raindrops from her hair. 
They were entering under the arch and into the amphitheater's half-circle, facing rows and rows of seats that climbed before them. Over here, Sandman, Phaedra said to Solomon, jerking her head in the direction of the petitioner's square, facing the dais where the council would sit when they arrived. The seats were already full to bursting, and Gilly approached them with a sigh, not looking forward to being part of the press. The front row was full, but when she approached with a glare, a hole appeared, the fay on either side, skittering away so she had ample space to sit. Gilly folded her legs primly, her attention trained on Phaedra and the dev. She watched the fay position him in the box, then move to stand with the other guards a few paces behind him. He deserves a thrasher, a male voice said a few rows above her. Let the thrasher flay his skin off, then pull his muscles apart bit by bit before grinding his bones. Gilly shivered, trying to block out the conversation, but her sensitive ears made it impossible. The thrasher is too good for him, another voice volunteered. His kind has to pay heavily to make up for all the evil they visited upon our kind. The punishment should take at least a year before he's allowed to die. A year, the first voice replied, disbelief in his voice. Why not a century? She turned then, unable to help herself. Standing, she pointed at the two fae, her eyes filled with fury. How about I spend a millennium pulling out your tongues, then growing them back, only to pull them out again? And why stop at your tongues? Eyes make such a delightful pop. Their faces went white, and they turned away, mouths closed. Gilly took a seat again unsurprised to see that the gaps on either side of her had grown. At this rate, I'll have the entire row to myself. A peal of trumpets drowned out her dark thoughts. A commotion went through the crowd, the excitement cresting to a fever pitch. Gilly followed her fingers into fists to keep them from shaking. There were no trumpets yesterday. What in the hells is about to happen? A scream went up when a tall fay male entered onto the dais, draped in expensive fabrics and heavy golden chains. His hand went up in a wave, and a wide smile graced his attractive face. He made stately progress to the center of the table and took a seat there, clearly enjoying the crowd's adoration. It took several moments for the residents of the realm to calm themselves long enough for Gilly to get a good look at the man who'd earned such a huge reaction. His eyes were light brown that turned to golden in the light, and his hair was dark blonde with red highlights that crackled like firelight. His features were symmetrical, his ears pleasantly pointed, and he was obviously a person of power in the realm. There was something about the total package that had her scratching her earlobe. All right, he said after a time, his tone melodic, magic somehow allowing it to carry easily into the crowd. Thank you for such a warm welcome. Perhaps I should show up to these kinds of things more often. Another cheer went up, the crowd ecstatic. But not Gilly. Horror filled her instead. He's just like her. Well, a male version anyway. They're not quite as identical as my sister Lena and I, but close. The man sitting in the dais, grinning nonchalantly, looked just like her mother, Queen Elspeth of the Fae. Chapter 3 The sound of a heavy stone orb impacting the wide wooden table called the crowd to attention. Sedaris, the eldest member of the Fay Council, stared out at the masses, his expression stern. His stately robe and bone-white hair made him look the part of the voice of the people, his station in the Fay ranks. When silence had fallen, he nodded once and spoke again to the crowd. Allow me to speak on your behalf and thank our beloved Prince Eddard for appearing today. With a flourish of his hands and a deep bow, his stoic expression shifted to one of obsequiousness. By his very presence, he indicates the weight of today's proceedings. Sedaris made a hand gesture, and the guards beside Phaedra came forward to stand on either side of Solomon and force him to his knees. Gilly's chest tightened and... Part of her thought the dev might try to take his alternate form, mutating into an over nine foot tall monster with tusks and bulging muscles. Her breathing slowed when she realized Solomon might be taking her advice instead. Although anger was visible in the lines of his body, the dev remained calm. Would you like to inspect the accused, your majesty? Sedaris asked. It seemed like he couldn't stop himself from bowing at the end of every sentence. 
Prince added cocked an eyebrow, his expression reminding Gilly of one the crone would make when she was trying to seem as if she hadn't already planned on doing the very thing that was being suggested to her. It was eerie and made her ears itch in discomfort. The handsome fae stood, and she heard swoons from some of the females in the audience. Gilly couldn't blame them for the simpering. And it was objectively attractive, after all, but she felt no libidinous urge toward him. Confusion blindsided her instead. Why do I see my mother in the shape of his face and the lines of his body? Even their bearings are similar. While Gilly hadn't known her mother, Elspeth, in her natural form for long, the similarities between the Fay Queen and Prince Edward were unmistakable. Furthermore, the mannerisms she'd seen in the crown, Elspeth's disguise she'd adopted in her quest for misguided revenge, were on full display in her male counterpart. Her mind was filled with calculations, but she blocked them out, trying to concentrate on what was unfolding before her. Edward walked off the edge of the dais, fluttering his wings gently to land effortlessly on the arena floor. Hands behind his back, he approached the petitioner's box. It has been some time since any of your race has dared to venture into Valencia. I had hoped your kind had been confined to the hells that you deserve. His voice boomed around the amphitheater, full of confidence and bravado. Gilly felt the crowd around her lean forward, hanging off the prince's every word. Although she could not see Solomon's face as he looked up at Prince Edward, she knew him well enough to envision the defiance in his eyes. Still, his words came out even, offering a simple explanation for his presence there. I was not brought to Valencia of my own free will. I would be happy to return to my own realm if given leave. Edith's smile was winning, and Gilly knew for certain he was playing to the crowd. What's the matter? Is Fay hospitality not to your liking? His words sent a ripple through the audience. There were several laughs, one a large guffaw that echoed through the space. But when she scanned the multitudes behind her, she saw several faces filled with vexation, which surprised her. A few muttered to one another, either unamused by the prince's antics or annoyed by them. Not everyone in the kingdom is a member of the prince's fan club, it seems. Interesting. Quiet! rumbled Sedaris, his bushy white eyebrows bent in irritation. The crowd once again settled. Edward straightened, his expression changing from an entertainer's grin to a solemn look of consideration. There has never been an incursion by dev forces into Valencia that has not been provoked by a hatred of our people and without a malicious motive. You could see how it might be hard to believe your appearance here is anything other than to plan. By that, do you mean it was the plan of your operative there to abduct me and bring me here against my will? Solomon matched the prince's tone, his delivery matter of fact. He jerked his head in Phaedra's direction. I had no intention of visiting your realm, nor am I part of some vast conspiracy to bring chaos to your realm. You claim it was an abduction, but our operative, as you call her, tells a different story. Edward motioned toward Phaedra, calling her forward. Isn't it true that the dev abducted you instead? Gilly's hands clenched against the fabric covering her thighs. It seemed someone had filled the prince in on Phaedra's testimony when the council had confronted her the day before. The way her story had played yesterday made Gilly's anxiety spike. It would take very little to turn the crowd against the dev, which she had no doubt the prince would encourage. Please tell your liege about the events preceding your arrival back to Valencia, Edward requested in an even voice. From her position, Gilly saw Phaedra's profile, and she thought the woman's face stiffened at the wording of the prince's request, but it didn't stop the fae female from responding confidently. I had been assigned to the rough, but treachery led to being transported off-world. I found myself in a hell realm, thrust into a situation in which I was outnumbered, iron having made my powers inaccessible. Gilly was familiar with the woman's story, having lived it herself but the audience ate up every element listening as Phaedra recounted their tale, from the slave market to her valiant escape. Feeling conflicted, anger and admiration warred within her. I want to like Phaedra, to be like her, but her perspective is limited. It reminds me of my thirst for revenge against the stone dwellers. Thank goodness 
Lena convinced me to see things in a different light? But how could Gilly convince an entire realm to forgive an enemy they'd been fighting against since time immemorial? There has to be a way, she thought, her eyes returning to Solomon, who stood unmoving. His shoulders were broad and strong, but she knew they carried a weight too heavy for anyone, no matter their strength. So, the accused state his intention to deprive you of freedom, Eddard asked. More than stated, he marched us across the sands, intent on selling us for untold riches. If the sandstorm hadn't cropped up, we'd be in the possession of one of the princes of darkness. A ripple of shock and unease rolled through the crowd, which seemed to be what the prince expected. Terrifying, he said, shaking his head in distress. But in the interest of equity, is there anyone who can corroborate your tale? Elsewise, it is your word against his. Vader nodded. There was a human in my company the entire time I was in the Hell Realm. She can validate all that I have said. This time, when Holly appeared at Phaedra's side from thin air, Gilly was expecting it, having seen it happen to Phaedra the same way yesterday. Someone has the power to transport witnesses to the amphitheater without their participation, she realized, noting the look of shock in the human's face. Holly was still blinking sleep from her eyes, and she rubbed her face, then looked around as if to confirm she was now the center of attention for a multitude of fae. This is unexpected, she said hazily, her expression sheepish. Is there, um, something I can do for you? She was speaking in the vague direction of the dais, but it was Prince Eddard who stepped forward to answer her. Indeed there is! Layering on a charming smile, he asked Holly to introduce herself to the council. From which realm do you hail, and how did you find yourself in Araman Abad alongside our Phaedra? My name is Holly Townsend, and I hail from, well, we don't really call it a realm so much as a planet, but it's called Earth. And I can't say exactly how I found myself in hell, but... It involves being pursued by a vampire who called me his mate. Mutters and curses exploded from the crowd. Gilly heard leech and bloodsucker before Sideris brought things back to order. Holly blinked in surprise, her cheeks heating. Gilly could see now that the audience was firmly on her side, empathizing with the delicate human who'd been hunted by a fiend. And did events unfold as Phaedra has told them? Holly nodded. She hasn't lied, but Solomon wasn't entirely evil. After Gilly put a ring on his finger, he became quite helpful. In fact, I'm certain we would have died when we fought that giant sea monster if Solomon hadn't... Edward rushed to cut her off. The council thanks you for your honest testimony, he interrupted, his smile beneficent. Turning back to Sedaris and his peers, Edward opened his arms wide. I believe the case has been made against the interloper. Interloper? Solomon grumbled. I thought I was your guest. Weren't you the one to mention the legendary fey hospitality? The prince's grin slipped, but only for a moment. I believe we have what we need to make our ruling. I disagree. Gilly found herself on her feet, her hand raised. Her patience with the farcical trial had ended. The accused was given no chance to defend himself, and you cut your witness off before she could give you a full picture of Solomon's character. The crowd was aghast at her interruption of the proceedings. Phaedra covered her face with her hands, shaking her head, while Holly gave Gilly a hopeful smile. Edward, however, seemed to be expecting her comments. With a polite inclination of his head, he answered, While I appreciate my niece's unique perspective, I must rely on what I know about the race of Dev. The word niece sent the assembly into a tizzy. Gilly knew Solomon wasn't the only draw for today's proceedings. After Sedaris' statement about the prophecy the day before and the sudden end of the council's meeting, Fay of the realm were eager to learn more about the unfolding drama, now that they'd realized she wasn't only a foreigner and a Fay without wings, but also a member of the Fay royal family. The audience wasn't sure how to feel about her. I will not demand your silence again, Sidera stated, his voice rough and tinged with frustration. I will close the proceedings to the public and toss you all out of the amphitheater and onto the street if you insist on interrupting again with your ceaseless 
prattling. Leave the judgment to the council. Sufficiently chastened, the masses came to order. Prince Eddard seemed to sense another outburst would cause chaos to reign and decided to draw things to a close on his own terms while still playing to the crowd. It is clear to your prince that the dev in our midst has earned his punishment and there are none better to decide his punishment than my esteemed parents, rulers of the realm. Eddard beamed at the cacophony his words set off, knowing they would provoke an unbridled reaction to the multitude despite Sedaris's threat. The applause was near deafening for Gilly, who now realized that despite the prince's own mixed reaction, the only thing the crowd felt for his parents was pure reverence. Sedaris muttered something inaudible, throwing his hands up in surrender, knowing the crowd could no longer be controlled, and it seemed to bask in the adulation, even though it was aimed at his parents. Her estimation of him sank, and she pegged him as a social climber who was happy enough to ride his parents' beloved coattails. The guards encircled Solomon, and Gilly couldn't help herself. She rushed forward, hoping to interrupt whatever they had planned for the dev. A muscular form with a wing enfolded on his broad back stepped into her path, and Gilly bounced back just before impact. "'Excuse me,' she said huffily, then tried to bypass him, but he blocked her at every turn. His Majesty requests your presence, he announced, staring down at her. In a minute, she replied, then leaped onto his shoulders without notice to get around him, but she'd underestimated the quickness of her fellow fay. He spun around, catching her by the wrist before tugging her back. Gilly slapped at his hold. He released her, but continued to stand in her way. The prince is an insistent man, he told her his expression broadcasting his willingness to continue the chase until she did as Eddard obeyed. She looked over his shoulder, hoping to catch sight of Solomon, but the petitioner's square was empty, no sign of the dev remaining. With a heavy sigh, she fell in behind the fey guard, less than enthused about her audience with her uncle Eddard. Chapter 4 The crystal peaks of Valencia's palace were blinding in the mid-morning sun. Gilly blinked and looked down, focusing on her feet as her steps carried her closer to the uncle she'd never known. And at this point, I'm not eager to get to know him either. Still, she told herself to look at the audience as an opportunity. Not only could she learn more about her family and the unexpected prophecy turning her world upside down, but she could beg for a suspended sentence for Solomon. You don't have to like him, Gilly, she reminded herself. You just need to persuade him. Her eyes adjusted when they walked under the roof of an ornately tiled portico, and she saw jewels beating the grout lines between the tiles. King Lyle's city in her own realm was a world of luxury compared to the simple lifestyle of the Fey Wilds, but the Fey of Valencia had taken extravagance to the next level. The interior of the palace put the exterior to shame. Every inch of wall, floor, and furnishings was studded with the trappings of extreme wealth, it was so over the top that Gilly developed a stomach ache, the garish surroundings being almost too much to take in without getting dizzy. They finally arrived in an audience chamber resembling the inside of a massive emerald. Glittering glass windows in the dome reflecting off the green crystal walls. On the far side of the room, up a few steps made from actual emeralds, the largest she'd seen, Gilly's uncle sat on the throne, flanked by two well-dressed hangers-on who whispered frantically in his pointed ears. His gaze rose to take her in, and he lifted his arm. The men straightened, then hurried away at the wave of his hand. Edward stood and descended the stairs, coming forward to embrace Gilly. She tried not to stiffen, but she wasn't comfortable in his arms. She pulled away as soon as politeness would allow. "'You don't look much like her, you know,' he said, softly brushing a lock of hair from her shoulder. But there's something about you that reminds me of your mother. Perhaps it's your backbone. She smiled because she knew he meant it as a compliment, but remained silent. There was something about Edda that put her guard up, but she couldn't spot anything specifically about his demeanor that caused her to feel that way. I hoped we could chat a little, he said, his tone friendly. But the atmosphere is too formal, wouldn't you say? Let's retire to my personal apartments where we can talk comfortably. The mention of his private apartments provoked a tinge of anxiety, but Gilly gave the prince the benefit of the doubt. 
She was listening to her instinct, but at the same time, getting information was a priority, and Prince Edward was well positioned to act as a font where she could fill her cup. The warrior who had corralled her fell in step behind them, and Gilly made note of it. Edward might be putting his best foot forward, but that didn't mean he trusted her. Reaching an intricately carved wooden door, Edward made a gesture with his hand, and the door opened before them. He ushered her in, leading her through a corridor graced by landscape paintings and marble tiles topped with statuary and vases holding elegant floral arrangements. I'd hate to be the one who has to clean this palace, she thought to herself. Fifty years would pass by the time I had dust every object we passed. Following the prince, Gilly was relieved when they entered a plain white chamber with minimal furnishings, including cushioned chairs. Edward motioned for her to take a seat beside him. The warrior stationed himself outside the door. She was a little taken aback by the change in decor, reconsidering her perception of her uncle. Maybe there is more here than meets the eye. Edward gave her a gentle grin. It's such a strange feeling. I've been waiting for you to show up for millennia, and yet now that you're here, I have no idea what to say to you. Gilly nodded, glad that he'd opened with a topic of interest. I know what we mean. Chance brought me here, only to learn my arrival was predestined. She shrugged, a gesture encompassing the randomness of the world around them. Edward laughed. <laughs> well said. How about some tea? At his inquiry, the door opened suddenly, and a slight serving woman standing in the doorway. She held a full tray in her hand. After scurrying forward, she set it down on the low table before them, then hurried out of the room again, shutting the door behind her. Gilly wondered how he'd pulled off the neat trick. Did he somehow summon her by a means she could not see, or was it the servant's job to keep tea ready for the prince at all times? She accepted a cup of tea from the prince and sipped it, glad for the warmth that traced through her system. Edward looked at her for a moment, the expression of his face shifting. Sadness tinged his eyes, and he let out a long breath. Let me ask the question that has been at the forefront of my mind for eons. How is my sister? Her response was neutral. That's a complicated question. The story was hers to tell. How Elspeth and Lyra were turned against one another by a sorcerer bent on consuming their world for energy. How Killy and Lena's connection had allowed them to look through each other's eyes. How they'd come together to defeat Rashawn and reunite the Queen and her consort. And how the Empress of Spiders, a scorned sorceress who wanted to claim Gilly's powers for her own, had led to her capture on Araman Abad. But she wasn't ready to share all of this with a relative she barely knew and did not trust. It must be, yes, he said, leaning in to pat her hand with his. I can't imagine what it must have felt like to be torn from your realm and made to face a world full of hellspawn without the benefits of your powers. I realized during the trial today that you seem to know many details about my time on Araman Abad. She kept her tone casual, but it was a loaded question. Edit hesitated for only a moment before admitting the truth with no hint of embarrassment. I've spoken at length with Phaedra. I'm afraid I had to know everything that happened to you, his expression was earnest. Family is of the utmost importance to me, and my parents would agree. Any news of my sister and her offspring is devoured greedily. I'm sorry, Gilly said, shaking her head. All of this has happened too quickly, and I'm still getting my bearings. I visited your temple, listened to Sedaris tell me about the prophecy, but that doesn't mean I understand what happened here and what is meant to happen. Of course, Edid said. All of this is a heavy weight to lay on you, and I hope you don't feel like you're being crushed underneath it. He patted her hand again, then grasped it and squeezed it before releasing her. What happened? Why did you send my mother away? Elspeth had been exiled by the ones she loved as a result of the prophecy. You were equipped with foreknowledge of what could happen in the future. Why not work together to try to avert the coming apocalypse? He hung his head. I wanted to badly, but the High Mage was the greatest seer in Fey history. What she proclaims always happens, exactly as expressed. The only hope we had of breaking the prophecy was to send her away. 
Gilly's brow furrowed. That doesn't make sense. If working together couldn't avert it, then how could sending her away? This was not an easy decision for any of us, Edward said stiffly. My heart is permanently cracked, and it cannot be mended until my sister returns. When she does, she'll destroy me, my parents, and the entire realm. She felt the anger radiating from him. Then why aren't you sending me away? I'm the harbinger of the great annihilation, after all. Send me away and let me take the dev with me. His features tightened. Do not make light of the situation. You are asking me to ignore the long history between the Paris and the dev. Paris? Gilly was confused. What is that? A peri is a fay in the foulness that is the dev tongue. Our ancient foes, they are diametrically opposed to everything fundamental to our race. We are the light and they are the darkness, his gaze searched her. Do not be seduced by the darkness, niece. You cannot paint every member of a race with the same brush, uncle, she counted. Surely you do not believe that no fay has ever acted with evil intent. Solomon is not my enemy. He helped me escape the hell realm, and he fought by my side. He does not deserve the treatment he's receiving at your hands. The prince shook his head sadly. This is a part of their power, part of their deception, he told her softly. He has convinced you he is not a threat, but it was he who took you to the Prince of Darkness. It was he who kept you in iron, and he only provided you help after you ringed him with silver. No, she denied his words, but his logic was persuasive. I know it may seem that way to an outsider, but you weren't there on our journey. I trust Solomon, and he has earned my forgiveness for his earlier treatment of me. She looked down, appearing contrite. I know we haven't known one another long, uncle, but I am not the sort to make capricious decisions when it comes to evaluating one's character. I'm sure you believe what you are saying, he replied, his pat feeling patronizing this time. But you must trust your elders. With those words, he stood, straightening his embroidered tunic. You'll have to forgive me, but a prince's schedule is seldom empty. I'm afraid I'm due elsewhere. My personal guard will see you out. Edward paused at the doorway and turned back, his expression once more formal. Keep a low profile during your time here in Valencia. Causing another scene like the one in the amphitheater today will not work out in your benefit. Although the prophecy is old enough to no longer be common fodder for gossip, they have notoriously long memories. Understood, she said, realizing he was giving her an order more than a suggestion. Good, he said with a sniff. I would hate for my people to cause you any disturbance over an ages-old familial disagreement. Let us work to start anew. In time, they will grow to know you, to accept you. Until then, avoiding conflict is advisable. Gilly nodded, then watched him exit. The beefy warrior moved into the doorway after Ed had left, motioning for her to follow him. With a sigh, she stood, realizing she'd been dismissed. She ignored the Lux surrounds, instead replaying their conversation in her head. The conversation had been short and not revealing enough for her liking. Not only had she failed to convince her uncle to release Solomon, but she'd learned almost nothing about the fallout from the prophecy that had driven her mother from Valencia ages ago. At least I revealed as little as he did, she told herself, enjoying a flash of pride. They were both being cagey, dancing around each other. Seems like we both have things to hide. Gilly didn't relish finding out exactly what those things were. Chapter 5 she saw the outline of the crystal palace as the sun set behind it from her place in the clearing. Trees towered above them, but a wide boulevard in the direction of the palace had been sown with quartz gravel that glowed in the twilight as if it lit from the inside. Gilly turned back to the plate before her and sighed, her stomach in no mood for the delicacies gathered there. She'd accompanied Holly to the outdoor dining area, taking a seat across from her at one of the long wooden tables dotting the clearing. The other fay had given them a wide berth, with the exception of a brunette with big brown eyes. Her wings seemed to stand at attention behind her as she made another note in the leather-bound journal in front of her. "'What are you writing, Taylor?' 
Holly asked, leaning over her pad with interest. At least I think those symbols are writing. She bit her lip and rubbed her head with an expression of confusion on her pretty face. Indeed they are, the fade named Taylor replied with a grin. This is our script, something you might call a modified logogram-based system. I might call it that, Holly said with wide eyes. I don't even know what a logogram is, she blinked. Wait, maybe I do. It's like the symbols we use to sell products. Sell products, Taylor repeated softly as she scribbled down another line. Perfect. Gilly rolled her eyes and released her fork to let it clatter to the table. Where's Phaedra? she asked, not bothering to hide her impatience. Holly shrugged and took a bite of the fruit in her hand. Mmm, she moaned, closing her eyes and chewing with extreme pleasure. Why does everything here taste so good? They have an innate connection to the land and are able to coax forth her fruits, their sweetest nectars, a tribute to our symbiotic affiliation. Gilly blinked at the winged fay and pursed her lips. What's your deal, anyway? Human affairs, scholar, Taylor said with a nod, then turned immediately back to Holly. Tell me about your supermarkets. Is it true each piece of fruit is individually wrapped in plastic to suffocate the poison inherent in your soil? How does one individually wrap, say, a bunch of grapes? Her pencil at the ready, Taylor jotted down Holly's response. The human giggled, then looked thoughtful. Some fruit is wrapped, but not individual grapes. Unless we allow the sun to wisen them up, and once they dry down, we call them raisins and put them in little paper boxes or small plastic pouches. She leaned back and wrinkled her nose. I guess comparing our worlds really makes you consider the same old things with a new perspective. Maybe we do try to suffocate our poisons with plastic in a way. Gilly let out a groan of frustration at the inanity of their conversation. How can they be talking about grapes and raisins when a man's life is on the line? Her head came up at an observation from Holly. Isn't that Phaedra over there? Her gaze followed the human's gesture and she caught sight of the fay in question. Her wings spread and at the ready, which seemed to be the relentless one's default stance. Phaedra was in conversation with two others in formal robes. Behind one of her interlocutors, Gilly made out the august form of the voice of the people, holding a steaming wooden mug and listening intently to what the relentless one said. She scowled, part of her wishing she could listen in on their conversation. Her conversation with Prince Edit had failed to illuminate anything of consequence about the prophecy. Nor had he given her much hope of freeing Solomon without a fight. Maybe I have a better shot of persuading the council, she told herself. But even as she thought the words, she had little hope in them. Phaedra was close and well known to the council. Had she been the one convinced in the righteousness of her hijacking Solomon to arrest him? The chances of Gilly radically realigning their beliefs were so thin as to be transparent. Grumbling to herself, she plucked a nut from her plate and brought it halfway to her mouth before discarding it in disgust. What's the use? There's no way I'm going to get Solomon out of this place before they irrevocably harm him. Taylor's eyes turned to her, and she set down her pencil. Why are you so concerned about a dev who tried to sell you into slavery? Her question was forthright, but seemed genuine and not rhetorical. It's not as easy as all that, Gilly replied. Sure, we got off to a rocky start, and I'm still pretty upset about his behavior when we first met, but when it came time to escape, he helped me every step of the way. But he was the one who put you in the situation you needed to escape from, Taylor pointed out, and the tide only turned when you ringed him in silver. Yes, Gilly shouted, then reined in her temper and spoke more quietly. I know everyone thinks he only helped me because he had to, but it wasn't like that. You you had to be there. Holly reached across the table to grip her hand. It did seem different. When we saw you two again after you escaped the demon prince's clutches, she said hopefully. It was different, Gilly insisted. He changed over the course of the journey, and so did I. I understand his motivations now. I learned why he's done the things he's had to. 
I won't justify his deeds, but I can see them from his perspective. She let out a heavy breath. He's not the monster you think he is, even if he sometimes looks like one. You've fallen for him. The words came from the human in hushed tones, and Gilly looked up frantically and yanked her hands away. Oh, sweetheart, Holly said, shaking her head and folding her fingers together to rest her chin on her hands. You've fallen for your captor. Stockholm Syndrome, Taylor cried, then picked up her pencil and began writing feverishly. I've heard of this. You humans have unique insight into emotional disorders. Holly dismissed the phase statement with a wave of her hand. We can't choose the ones we love. Not really. Her voice held a note of sadness, and Gilly wondered if it related to her own situation as a vampire's mate. The human sat up straight, slamming her hands on the table and eliciting a few confused glances from the face scattered around other tables. True love, that's what this is. She ignored Gilly's attempts to backpedal, instead standing up to come around the table and put her hands on Gilly's shoulders from behind. Holly leaned in, rubbing her shoulders and speaking close to her ear. And you have to do anything you can to preserve real, true love. Gilly turned to look up at her. What do you mean? I didn't say it was true. I'll help you both escape, Holly interrupted. Somehow we'll find a way to get you out of here so you can start your lives together. I appreciate the enthusiasm, Gilly said, gently extracting herself from the human's grip. But maybe you should sit back down. I don't like the looks we're getting from our goodly hosts. Holly smiled and nodded, then bustled back around the table to reclaim her seat. Gilly stared down a fey male who gave her a look he might not waste on even a lowly goblin or kobold. He finally looked away, but she had the feeling maybe her welcome among the fey of Valencia might be worn out shortly. How are we going to feast Solomon? Holly mused aloud, her fingers scratching idly at her chin. There has to be some way to get him out of the jail. The citadel is impenetrable, Taylor told her. Too many guards to sneak in and out. You'd be caught a hundred times over before you reach the prisoner. Hmm, Holly said, her face screwing up. There must be some way. She turned her attention to Taylor. You're an academic, she said, gesturing toward the journal. You must have all sorts of ideas. Treasonous ideas, Taylor shook her head. That dev is in prison for a reason. Releasing him would be foolish, and I would face the wrath of not only the council, but also the royal family. Holly slid closer, putting her arm around the fae, being mindful of her wings. True love is the highest law. There can be no treason when in the service of Cupid. Taylor looked confused for a moment, then had a moment of recognition. You mean the chubby babies responsible for killing the Saint Valentino with their tiny arrows? Gilly was lost, but Holly let out a peal of laughter. Exactly! I never expected to meet a face so knowledgeable about my history and culture. You're amazing! The tailor preened under her compliments like a bird proud of her bright feathers. I've made understanding humans my life's work. Good thing you've got a long life, Gilly muttered. Ignoring her, Holly continued her flattery offensive. You know, if you land a hand with this, you can document a genuine human-based adventure as part of the group. Think of the kind of insider information you'll uncover. Stars filled Taylor's eyes. I could see your reactions firsthand, talk through your logic, and ask you questions about your decisions as you make them. Gilly saw the fay was tempted. I bet this kind of opportunity doesn't come around very often for our human affairs scholar. And once we've taken care of this little task, I bet Holly would be willing to give you a tour of her, her, uh, her earth, or whatever her realm is called. Taylor's gaze shot to Holly, who gave her a solemn nod. The fae breathed deeply, mentally debating the merits of committing treason as an entree into the culmination of her life studies. At last, she ventured a suggestion. Although entry and exit portals are watched closely in Valencia, a few spots link directly to the rough that aren't heavily guarded. The rough, you say? Golly poked up, leaning in, speaking softly. Tell me more. 
Taylor's gaze flitted back and forth, looking over the clearing for anyone who might be aiming a listening ear in their direction. If we can get your dev out of the citadel, and that's a big if, then we may be able to smuggle him to the rough via the portal. From there, you can find a way to escape Valencia's orbit entirely. Fledging leaves of hope unfurled inside her. Gilly felt a grin start to spread across her face. With your help, I'm certain we can work out a way to make it to a portal. And not only would I be forever in your debt, but Holly will know that she can trust you with all her deepest secrets. Eagerness filled the Fae's eyes at Holly's nod. To true love, she said, lifting her glass of summer wine. True love, Holly echoed, toasting with a piece of fruit that she didn't wait to gobble down. Uh, true love, Gilly muttered, not wanting to admit the depth of feeling to herself. But they're not wrong, she realized. I do love the fool, as much as I might wish I didn't. And now it looks like he might live a little longer, maybe even long enough for us to make life together. Whatever that would look like. Deciding to ignore the litany of concerns she had about starting a relationship with the dev, she let herself feel good for the first time in ages. She took a drink of water just as Taylor picked up her pencil and asked her human subject another question. Have you ever had sex outside your species? Gilly spit water across the table before dissolving into a fit of giggles. Chapter 6 Run me through how this works one more time, Holly said, and Gilly had to hold back a groan. It had been a long night spent with the human and her fey hanger-on, staying out of Phaedra's earshot while coming up with what seemed like a concrete plan. Except their human companion seemed to have trouble remembering all the steps. Gilly had admired the way she'd subtly manipulated Taylor, the human affair scholar, and she'd thought that maybe the human was more on the ball than she'd given her credit for. Being forced to repeat the plan for yet another time had her second-guessing her assessment. We've been over this. In fact, your idea is the linchpin of the whole plan, remember? Gilly tried to keep her voice encouraging and not to let her mounting frustration show in her tone. Right, the old sick inmate trick, just like in the prison movies, Holly nodded to herself. Solomon pretends to be sick, then when the guards open his cage, he overpowers them and sneaks out. Not exactly, Gilly replied, unable to stop herself from rubbing her face in exhaustion. But that was where the idea started. They'd spent several hours talking around Holly's suggestion of having Solomon pretend to be sick and then turning on the guards. She described a scene from some sort of entertainment form called a movie. The inmate had pretended to be grievously ill, then had sprung up to get the drop on his captor. The conversation had quickly devolved with Taylor demanding an in-depth discussion about what exactly a movie was and its relation to things called film and cinema. When Holly had started describing a mystical place called Holly Woods, that could have been her family estate where the roads were studded with stars. Gilly had finally stepped in to bring them back around to the topic at hand. So you're suggesting he plays sick, then hits the guards with a surprise attack? Taylor shook her head. I wouldn't suggest that. Fey guards aren't easily overpowered, and no matter what the dev claims, they'll assume he's deceitful. He won't be able to catch them by surprise so easily. Holly sent up a noise of distress. You can't tell me that they are indestructible. You must have some weakness. Even Superman has kryptonite. Superman has what? Taylor asked, and they descended down another rabbit hole of human culture that devolved into a discussion of flight with or without wings. Ladies, Gilly cried, throwing her hands in the air. We aren't getting any closer to figuring this out. No more digressions into human comedy books. Comic books, Holly corrected. Then she wilted under Gilly's glare. Right. Well, the question remains. What is a Faye's biggest weakness? Taylor stiffened, her eyes going wide. Holly clutched at her. You have an idea, don't you? Spill it, girl. Every one of my rice has the ability to change their features to resemble someone else. Your glamour, Gilly nodded. Some of the fae from my realm have that same ability, myself included. 
Although Taylor looked uncomfortable with the subject, she continued, While everyone has the glamour ability, things can go a little sideways. Our ancestors went through a period in which that ability was used without thought to the consequences, and when no one can be exactly sure who they're talking to, trust is non-existent. Gilly considered her words. The few fae she'd known who could glamour had been parsimonious with their powers, and now she could see why. Makes sense. And so, after the chaos of those times was put behind us, impersonating someone else has become extremely taboo among my people. No one does it, for fear of becoming a social outcast. Which means they'll never see it coming, Holly's eyes lit up, and Gilly once again wondered if she were as dumb as she seemed to be. From there, their plan had unfolded. The guards wouldn't be expecting anyone to impersonate the dev, which meant they could disguise one of their party as Solomon, didn't switch the dev out for themselves. They could then sneak Solomon out of the citadel and to a portal off-world. Gilly once again walked Holly through their plan. In a few minutes, we'll set off for the citadel. We'll use our glamour to alter your features to resemble Solomon's. Then I'll create a diversion while you and Taylor retrieve him from his cell and sneak him out. We meet up and head to the portal, and an hour from now, Solomon and I leave Valencia for good. Right, I've got it now, Holly gave a decisive nod, but her expression didn't fill Gilly with much confidence. You sure? she asked the human, her patience a thin, vibrating thread on the verge of snapping. We can't make any mistakes. If we mess this up, I might not get a second chance. I won't let you down, Holly's tone was solemn, then she smiled. True love never fails. There's that beautiful human optimism, Taylor said cheerfully. Despite being one of the shortest lived races in the web, you believe so fiercely, live so fully. It's admirable. Thanks, Holly said with a shrug. She looked up through the leafy branches of the tree they'd been talking under for the last few hours. The sky is lightning. Didn't you say that early morning hours were the best time for our operation? Taylor nodded. It's the quietest time in our realm. The end of the dream day, some call it. Everyone who is asleep wants to stay there, and those who aren't asleep want to be. Our chances of success are highest. Let's go, Gilly said, standing and then reaching down toward her companions to help them up. The three of them set off down the path toward the citadel, and Gilly's heart beat so loud she thought it might echo through the treetops. Taylor motioned for them to stop once they'd reached the vicinity of the citadel. Help me with the glamour, she told Gilly. You know your dev's appearance better than I do. Gilly turned her thoughts to imagining the lines of Solomon's face. He's handsome. Too handsome for his own good. Or mine. Raven hair. Eyes like midnight. Sun-kissed skin. A smile that makes my insides melt. She focused her powers on the human, then took Taylor's hand, linking their powers before taking the lead as she weaved the illusion over Holly. It tingles, the human said with a giggle. Her image shifted suddenly, becoming wavy like ripples disturbing the surface of a pool. She shot up in height, her shoulders widening, her skin darkening. Before long, the image of Solomon, the second son, Hammer of the Dunes, and Scourge of the Sands stood before them. Well done, Taylor said, congratulating herself as much as Gilly. I was afraid my glamour abilities had atrophied from disuse by now. They crouched in floral bushes on the perimeter of the citadel, looking over the area. Two guards stood outside the wide doors, their eyes bleary. Their posture relaxed. They look to be on the verge of sleep already, Holly said, excited. It won't take much to get by them. Let me worry about it, Gilly said. You two focus on getting in those doors and finding the key to Solomon's cell. If anyone comes upon you, say the prisoner was summoned by Prince Eddard. That should explain why he's out of his cell. Emotion overwhelmed her. A lot was riding on the next few minutes. On a whim, she leaned in and hugged Holly, then got a strange sense of vertigo, realizing the human was hiding inside the dev's form. Her eyes might think she was hugging Solomon, but her mind knew it was all an illusion. Thank you for helping me. The cell isn't too uncomfortable, so just sit tight and wait to be discovered. The glamour will probably end the moment I transport off-world, so be ready for that. Aw, shucks, Holly said in a comedic tone. And I was just getting used to being a sexy beefcake. Come on, Taylor said, her voice high and reedy, the stress of her impending treason getting to her. 
Let's get a little closer so we can be ready to run when Gilly distracts the guards. The Fae led Holly into the remnants of the night while Gilly returned her attention to the Citadel's entrance. How am I going to get rid of these two acorn hoarders, she asked herself, without waking up the rest of the city in the process? A bird chirped in the distance, its staccato call bouncing off the trees around her. Inspiration hit her, and a plan formed in her mind. The natural affinity she felt for the Fae Wilds and all of its various inhabitants, both plant and animal, deriving from her heritage, had given her abilities beyond most other fae, especially when it came to her bonds with nature. Gilly silently lifted herself into the branches of the tree she stood under, climbing until she found a crow sitting there staring at her with interest. She leaned down to address the bird. I'm going to need a little assistance. Go find your friends and bring them back. I've got a task for you. It nodded once, then flew away in a rush of wings. Gilly waited for it to return, counting the seconds and wondering if she'd attempted the wrong tactic. But it only took a couple of minutes for the crow to return with half a dozen companions. Drawing on her natural powers, she persuaded the crows to do her bidding, although it really wasn't too difficult. Gilly found crows to be capricious creatures who enjoyed a bit of mischief. See those two down there? I want you to put on a show distract them enough to convince them to follow you away from the door and toward that giant pine over there. I need you to make sure they're watching you and not what's happening at the entrance. Do you understand? The crows held a short conclave, chirping softly to one another. The lead crow turned back to Gilly and nodded thrice briskly. Good, she said, her smile wide. Show me what you got. Off they flew in formation, zooming down to stop suddenly and hover before the two guards, who blinked at them in surprise. "'You say that?' one said to the other. "'I think those birds are trying to tell us something.' Gilly slapped the hand over her mouth to stop herself from laughing in glee, as the crows set off creating different geometric shapes by flying in careful patterns. It was mesmerizing the way the shapes flowed one into the other, and she admired their skill. The guards watched as if hypnotized, and when the birds moved backward in the direction of the pine tree Gilly had indicated, the gods followed slowly after them, unable to stop watching the miracle taking place in front of them. Without a sound, Gilly crept out of the tree and made her way to the entrance. She watched Taylor and the Solomon lookalike slip in a few moments before her, then picked up her steps, hoping to join them. She traced the route Phaedra had taken her yesterday morning, but she froze, blending into the shadows when a yawning guard crossed the corridor. The need for stealth slowed her steps, so she was several turns away from the dev's cell when she saw Taylor rushing in her direction. "'Turn around!' she said in a loud whisper. "'Go back to the entrance!' Gilly looked past the fate to see Solomon turn the corner behind her. She couldn't be sure if this was the dev himself or Holly in disguise, but by the look on Taylor's face this wasn't the time to find out. She did as told, hurrying back in the direction she'd just come. When they rushed out into the night— Taylor risked speaking, her words coming out in a worried tumble. I don't know how long we have. The human is braver than any of her race have a right to be, but I think they might suspect something. Is it you? Gilly directed her words to Solomon, searching his face for any sign of whose consciousness was behind his dark eyes. Can't you tell? he asked, then winked. His hand on the small of her back, he propelled her forward. If I had time, Mujisa... I'd prove who I was by kissing you senseless before patting your behind. The human isn't the only one who's brave, but you take too many risks. Already complaining and I haven't even gotten you off world yet. You must be Solomon, Gilly said, her tone laced with sarcasm. He chuckled, then hurried her forward after the fay in front of them, who was sprinting through the trees. They snuck swiftly through the city, skirting buildings and any signs of fay activity. Less than ten minutes later, she watched Taylor duck into an arched trellis covered in vines with big white flowers that started to bloom under the rising sun. Gilly followed her with Solomon close behind. Here it is, Taylor said, breathless. And we managed to get here when it's deserted, but we won't have much time. Patrols pass by every hour. What do we do? Gilly asked, looking around, confused. They were in a copse of rhododendron bushes, the clearing in between made of dirt and fallen leaves and blossoms. You step into the middle of the ring and off you go. This portal leads to the largest of the pocket dimensions that makes up the rough. You'll have the best chance of finding someone to take you where you're going there. What ring? Solomon asked, scanning the bushes with a puzzled expression. 
That one, Taylor said, moving toward the middle of the clearing and holding her hand out in front of her. A red circle blazed to life a few steps in front of her, in the centre of the copse. Gilly took Solomon's hand and advanced without hesitation. Together they entered the circle, and Gilly waved back at Taylor. Thank you, she said, a voice filled with gratitude. Taylor nodded and tried a smile. Try the tavern in Grandel's Batch. You might have some luck there. Before Gilly could reply, her stomach dropped, air wishing past her sensitive ears. They were no longer in Valencia, the portal having activated. Squeezing Solomon's hands, she braced herself for the unknown. Chapter 7 Gilly's feet hit the ground. She bubbled but did not fall. Looks like I'm getting used to this mode of transportation, she thought, unsure how to feel about that realization. She scanned the area around them, taking in an overgrown thicket flush with brambles and stinging nettles, among other nuisance plants. The world was too dim to see very far, and Gilly noticed that, unlike Valencia, where the sun had been in the process of rising, in the rough, darkness prevailed. Are you okay? She lifted her eyes at the sound of Solomon's rough voice, then looked down to see that their hands were still connected. Fighting a blush, she lifted her gaze to his. His face was covered in shadow, but his eyes shone, filled with an eternal light that she couldn't quite read. Gilly let go of his hand then, feeling embarrassed to have held it for so long after arriving. A part of her lamented the loss of contact, and she already missed the heat of his palm against her. I'm okay, she said at last. You? I'll be better once I get these things off of me, he said, holding up his arms so the silver shackles around them clinked together. Right? Gilly's eyes followed the path leading from the portal through a narrow opening between two overgrown holly bushes. We should probably put a little distance between us and the portal just in case our subterfuge is discovered sooner rather than later. We'll find some place protected where we can try to get those things off you. She set off down the path and heard him following. Ducking beneath a limb of holly, Gilly carefully made her way through the tight point until it opened again. They were still surrounded by vegetation, but she could at least see the sky. It was starry, and a pregnant moon hung overhead. It was morning when we left, yet it is the middle of the night here, she mused aloud. Does that mean time works differently in the rough, or is it portal travel that distorts time? I would venture it's the former rather than the latter, Solomon answered. Each realm, even a pocket realm like this one that acts as a satellite to a larger realm, has its own time progression, so night here is day in Valencia. In fact, I have heard of realms where time itself flows differently. You can spend hours there in what would be mere minutes here, or vice versa. Gilly shivered, thinking of how jarring such a transition could be. Someone could be imprisoned for eons in a pocket realm, only to find a single day has passed at home. She didn't like the direction of her thoughts, but something about this place gave her the creeps. There was a sinister air among the overgrown trees and thick underbrush, and she felt more at ease than she normally would in a forest setting. Where do you think this grand old batch might be? She asked more to distract herself from her wayward thoughts than to receive a real answer. Your guess is as good as mine, Muji, sir. His use of the term of endearment warmed her insides. She hadn't spent much time thinking about the significance of the name, but she couldn't help thinking it meant there was a chance the dev returned some of the deep emotions she felt for him. Gilly knew he wasn't immune to her charm. The way he kissed her told her that. But lust and love were distant cousins far removed, and she couldn't be sure which one was behind his behavior toward her. We should be happy, she said suddenly, looking over her shoulder at him. Somehow we managed to get you away from a realm full of fae who are bent on destroying you. But there is something about this place that seems to squeeze all the joy right out of me. I feel it too, Mujisa, and it makes me wonder how the high-minded Valencia fae could let a place such as this exist connected to their own realm. For the fae obsession with light, this place feels like the opposite. His observation rang true with Gilly. Why would the fae be bracketed by the rough? What use could they have for a place full of schemers and ne'er-do-wells if the rough is anything like the place Phaedra had depicted, she wondered. Solomon started to answer, then froze at the sound of a howl in the distance. That sounds like a warning. We're being watched, Gilly agreed, scanning the trees, but she could see nothing hidden there. 
Let's try to get those shackles off you now, in case whatever is making that noise is summoning the troops. Salmon held out his hands, the silver chains linking his wrists dangling between them. Gilly focused her magic on the chain, concentrating on breaking a link. When the link remained intact, she touched a finger to it, directly channeling her power into the material. Nothing's happening, she grunted, grabbing the chain with both hands and pouring her power into the silver. Why is nothing happening? I think we're out of time to find out, Solomon said softly, jerking his chain at a section of trees. Gilly spun around to see several pairs of golden eyes glowing among them. Fear sped up her heartbeat, and she gathered herself for an impending attack. The creatures surrounding them wasted no time. They came out of the trees, eyes still glowing, their bodies slowly resolving themselves out of the shadows. They were muscularly built, but on a smaller frame than a fay, the tallest one only reaching five feet. Their bodies were covered in a light gray coating of fur, featuring black spots in an abstract pattern. "'What manner of creature is this?' Solomon asked, reaching instinctually for the hammer that was usually strapped to his back before the chains at his wrist stopped him. "'I believe they're called gnolls,' Gilly replied, recalling the hefty book of off-world creatures the crone had kept as a reference. "'They're not known for their intelligence, and they love to fight.' Yeah, "'At least there's only a handful of them,' Solomon said, with a hint of hope in his voice. "'Then another howl rent the night.' They swiveled around to see another half-dozen of the creatures come out of the greenery behind them. Although they were man-sized, their faces resembled a dog's, with a brutish snout and pointed teeth drool already dripping between them. Their round ears were set high on their head, and each one seemed to be wearing the same malicious grin. She felt Solomon's back against hers. "'You take the ones on your side,' he told her, "'and I've got these ones here. Hollow if you need help.' With that announcement, the dev roared, leaping forward to tackle two of the dog-faced creatures and catching the others off guard. Gilly shook her head, a smile appearing on a face of its own accord. She admired his willingness to throw himself into any situation, but even more, Gilly appreciated that Solomon thought she could handle herself in situations like these. All right, let's show these puppies who's boss. The nearest gnaw lunged at her and Gilly dropped, sweeping her leg out and spinning, connecting with the beast's shins and knocking it over. She somersaulted backward and leaped up, grabbing a low-hanging branch and swinging herself forward. Her feet connected with two more, knocking her adversaries back. Her efforts, however, did not win her much time as the creatures bounced back quickly, growling and snapping as they attempted to surround her. Gilly reached deep inside her for her magic, lifting her arms and bringing them together, in a clap that was echoed by a loud peal of thunder. A second later, purple lightning streaked from the sky to hit the six targets arrayed around them. There were howls of pain as the bolts connected, the gnolls scattering, their backs still smoking as they threw themselves back into the thicket. Chastened by the lightning, Gilly turned her attention to the creatures attacking Solomon, then froze, trying to take in the blur of activity happening around the towering dev. Knolls threw themselves at him, one after another, and he batted them away, his large fists knocking them back with ease. This only seemed to make the Knolls meaner, and they led with their teeth, driving their canines deep into Solomon's skin. She watched him shake them off one by one, his expression intent. When his blood started to flow from numerous bites, Gilly catapulted into action. Her magic reserves were low, and she worried about expending too much power after that lightning attack in case something even worse was hiding in these woods. Longing for a blade, she made do, snapping a branch off a nearby limb and propping it up against the ground before driving her heel down on it, causing it to snap off and leave a jagged point. Her makeshift spear in hand, Gilly wasted no time, driving it into the neck of the nearest knoll. Because it wasn't exactly sharpened, the wound it made was too shallow to kill the creature, but it did enough damage to drive it back. Gilly shook the spear at the knoll, baring her teeth and growling in threat. The knoll blinked twice, then turned tail and ran. Another knoll entered her field of vision, sailing in an arc away from the dev to hit a tree across the clearing and slide down it. It fell into the bushes and didn't come back to its feet. The four knolls remaining reevaluated their chances against the strangers in their midst. Come on, Solomon growled, his face flashing with rage. Try it! You'll find you're outmatched at twice the number. His menacing gesture made them all flinch, and a moment later the remaining gnolls slunk back into the forest, disappearing in the dark. 
Gilly let out a sigh of relief, then hurried to check Solomon's wounds. The dev wasn't badly hurt, but she still ripped a piece of her robes off to dab at the bites. We should clean these out thoroughly when we find a water source. Something tells me those things' mouths aren't exactly sanitary. We need to find civilization, he said, his eyes scanning the forest in case their enemies returned. Those knolls might not have been much of a threat, but something tells me they were nowhere near the worst of whatever else is in these woods. Gilly nodded, his words echoing her own perception. Not to mention the fact that our deception in Valencia might not last forever. If someone is dispatched to find us and bring us back, it won't be too hard to track us down. We gotta find someone to get us out of here before we're caught. Or worse. She shook her head. It seems like I spent all my time figuring out how to escape a place. What is it going to feel like when I'm finally where I want to be again? Glancing at the dev, she dropped the question knowing that when she made it home, they would have to part ways. A part of her wondered if she'd find herself aching for escape from the Fey Realm, longing for the handsome Hellspawn who'd stolen her heart. Solomon grabbed her, tugging her down the path that continued between the trees. She allowed him to guide her, feeling too lost to take the lead. Lost in thought, lost in emotion, lost in the feeling of his skin against mine. Gilly tried to push the cascading thoughts out of her mind and focus on the journey at hand but it became increasingly difficult to ignore the intensity of her desire for the dev. On to Grandel's batch, she said as much to herself as to him. Onward to escape. One more step on the path that would lead them in different directions. I only hope I'm able to find myself after he's gone, or I may feel lost forever. Chapter 8 We're lost! Gilly stopped in her tracks turning in a slow circle and scanning the forest around them. It was much the same as it had been for the last few hours, with no distinguishing landmarks save the gravel path that continued through the trees in front of and behind them. This path seems to be leading us in circles, or there is something else afoot in this forest. Solomon paused, letting out a heavy breath. <sighs> I couldn't say. I feel a bit groggy in this place. I've never been among trees so tall and dark before. Gilly blinked, angling her head. I feel groggy, too. But I shouldn't. I didn't sleep last night, but that's become a common occurrence lately. She feared something more ominous was to blame. The moon still hung above them. She could see through the trees, but its position was lower. Maybe we can get our bearings when dawn breaks. It can't be too far off by now. Although she spoke the words, it didn't make them true. The rough was a mystery to her and she could only make predictions based on her experience. Maybe night never ends here. Maybe whatever is hiding behind all the leaves and brambles is counting on us, not knowing that fact. And maybe I'm starting to lose it from lack of sleep and endless wandering. Should we bed down? Try to rest? She asked him, unsure of what to do. If they were lost, continuing to walk might only result in them being even deeper into unfamiliar territory. Solomon shook his head. This place is dangerous. I can sense it, and so can you. Whatever is making us feel this way is stalking us. I'm sure of it. Gilly didn't have the confidence he did, but in the absence of any pet ideas, she followed him when he set off down the path once more. The landscape remained the same, the forest too deep to see further than a couple of rows of trees. We could be less than a mile from town and never know it, she mused wondering why anyone would build a path that led to nowhere. Someone is trying to spell us. Gilly moved closer to the dev, falling in step beside him. Spell us? Who? I don't know, he replied gruffly, his gaze on the trees around him. But I can feel it. That grogginess, it isn't normal. Something tells me that we're under the influence of someone else's magic. Gilly opened her mouth to speak, but before she could, there was a faint rustle of leaves behind them. She whirled around to see a familiar figure make its way out of the forest and onto the path, moonlit illuminating his pale features. She froze, his eyes locking onto hers, capturing her entire attention. I know that man, except he's not a man. He's a vampire. The one from Holly's dream? Gilly didn't know his name, but... She knew he was a threat of enormous magnitude. We're in danger. Run! 
Although she could think those things, her mind wouldn't allow her body to obey. They were trapped in the leech's gaze as it made its way forward. Stop where you are, or find your head ripped from your shoulders. Solomon's voice was thick and rough, and he walked around Gilly to block her from the vampire's gate, breaking the thing's grip on her mind. She shuddered and stumbled, but kept her feet by grabbing the dev's arm. "'What are you doing here?' she asked, being careful not to make eye contact with the vamp. He didn't answer, instead lifting his head to sniff the air, an expression of ecstasy taking over his face. "'Where is she?' he asked, suddenly animated, his eyes flashing. "'You will tell me!' "'You're not the one giving orders here, leech. I am!' Solomon leaned in, his expression full of menace, and Gilly expected him to take his monstrous form to do battle with the creature, but he didn't, which made her realize the face Silvers around his wrist might be more limiting than she understood. If he can't transform and my magic is almost empty, then we're no match for this vampire. Despite her summation, the dev wasn't backing down, but when the vamp glided forward suddenly and Solomon lunged for him, a quick flick of the vamp's wrist had the dev flying back, landing on the ground and skidding a few paces before coming to a rest. I can smell her on you, the leech said, his tight grin exposing two perfectly pointed canine teeth. His eyes bored into her again, and she could feel his influence washing over her, like a thousand fingers looking for any purchase they could find to dig into her and hold on tight. Where is she? he asked, coming closer and smelling her, his eyes closing in pleasure. When he broke eye contact, Gilly stumbled backward again, released momentarily from his powers. Where is who? she asked, taking several steps away from him and coming to a crouch beside Solomon. The dev had a look of discomfort on his face, but he'd pulled himself into a sitting position and shook his head to clear the lingering effects of the impact. Helping him to his feet, it was Gilly's turn to stand in front, keeping him safe from further attack. The vampire scowled at her. Don't toy with me, girl. Her scent is all over you. Where is the human? Holly, tell me, and I may spare your life. Keep talking like that, and you're the one who will need sparing, Solomon growled, no longer content to stand aside. His fists balled up. He charged toward the leech, intent on grievous bodily harm. The vampire raised his hand and Salmon froze in his tracks, standing like a bronze statue while the leech walked around him to continue his conversation with Gilly. She avoided his gaze, trying furiously to think of a way to drive the creature away from him before Solomon got himself killed. The leech could drain us both before we even realize it. He's powerful, deadly powerful. Without their powers at their maximum, it wouldn't be easy to convince him to leave us alone. I could tell him where Holly is, she thought, then immediately retreated from that notion. I could never betray a friend like that. She knew this unhinged creature considered the human female his eternal mate, which meant Holly was in for a world of hurt if the leech did find her. There has to be another way. You know where she is, he whispered, his tone almost seductive. Gilly had heard much about vampires. They were one of the most feared beings in the web, and fey children learned on their parents' knees to fear and avoid them. But how to fight them was something warriors discussed in hushed tones, most hoping to avoid ever having to. I don't even know who you're talking about, she fibbed, putting as much confidence into her tone as she could manage. The vampire hissed in angst, gliding forward, arms outstretched, he warned her not to lie again. I can make you tell, but I guarantee you won't like how it feels. Panic hit her, and she clutched at her magic, knowing she would only get one shot at whatever came next. Gilly was exhausted, but whatever reserves she had, it was time to use them. You won't talk to me that way come morning, leech. Using every less scrap of her power inside her, Gilly raised her hands, casting the first spell every fey learned, the one that channeled their inner brightness into the world around them. Light bloomed from her body, filling the clearing as if the sun had climbed over the trees and was showering the forest with its light. The vampire let out a howl of agony, 
He threw an arm up, swinging his cloak around him to cover his body from the rays, then shrank off into the forest in the hopes of avoiding the light. Mark my words, Fay, I'll be back, and you won't get away so easily tonight. As the vamp's footsteps retreated into the woods, Solomon suddenly shuddered, the spell around him breaking. He blinked, then looked around him. Where did that bloodsucker go? One good hit from me, and I'll knock both his fangs out. He's gone. For now, at least, Gilly said, the light around them beginning to fade as the last of her magic petered out. We don't have long, though. We need to move now. Giving the dove a shove, she took off at a run, down the path and deeper into the forest. The landscape around them changed, and she shook her head, realizing the vamp had been toying with them since they arrived. No wonder everything looked the same. He made certain we'd get lost in the woods. The vampire had somehow messed with their perception, had made them feel like they were making progress, but in reality, they might still be close to the portal. Just now, starting out their journey in earnest, how much longer will we have to walk to find Grandel's Batch now? The path started to climb, a little ridge of rock appearing. Gilly jogged up it, her head turning back to watch the path behind them, paranoid they'd find the vampire on their heels once again. Still, the sky above them was finally lightning, which meant dawn was truly on its way. If we can make it to shelter, we can regroup before pitting ourselves against the leech again. It was a big F, however, because the forest around them continued endlessly. This isn't working, Solomon said with a groan of frustration. We need to find a way to get out bearings or remain hopelessly lost among these blasted trees. That isn't the tree's fault, Gilly answered. Blame the leech. He's the one who kept us mixed up for hours. The trees are harmless. She made her way around a large trunk, then froze, slapping her hand to her head. I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier, she said, then grabbed at the trunk and started to haul herself up. What are you doing? Solomon asked, watching her progress. Planning to sleep in a tree? I'm not sure I'm up for it. What if I go to turn over and roll off the branch entirely? We're not going to sleep here, she said, continuing to climb. Though they're more comfortable than you might think. I'm going to climb to the top if I can, and see if I can spot any break in the force from above. Good thinking, he called, and she warmed at his praise. Gilly skillfully picked her way from branch to branch. Before long, she was able to poke her head out from the leafy canopy to try to locate anything that might be a village, town, or city. There, she cried, her eyes locking onto a wisp of smoke curling from the treetops. Smoke from a chimney or fire to the east. Can't be more than two miles away. Gilly clambered down even faster than she'd made it up to the top. Dropping in front of Solomon with a smile on her face, the dev, however, was less enthusiastic. How do we know it's a chimney? It could be more of those gnaw things gathered around a cook fire and eager to add more meat to the feast. She shrugged a shoulder. It could be, but why would they build a path that led right to their camp? She pointed to the gravel that continued to run through the trees in the direction of the smoke. We gave up too early. Come on. Let's see if we can find that civilization you mentioned. Solomon grumbled, but he set off as instructed. The sun greeted them when they finally stepped out of the tree line to see a small valley, a village nestled within it. You think that's Grandel's batch? She asked him with a grin. He shrugged. At least they've likely got a restaurant or two, which is all I care about at this point. That and making sure no more vampires catch us flat-footed. Speaking of, she said, indicating the shackles around his wrist, maybe we should take a minute to get those off you. I don't think it'll look too good if you saunter into town while still in silver chains. Believe me, if I could pull them off myself, I would, he told her impatiently. But even with your magic, we couldn't get them off. Exactly, which is why we're going to try non-magical means. She bent down to pick up a sharp rock, then pointed at a nearby tree. Stretch your arms across the tree there, and I'll see what I can do. The dev did as she suggested, and Gilly lifted the rock, focusing her efforts on one particular link. While the silver was strong and had been reinforced against magic, it was still just silver, and it couldn't stand up under the bashing of a rock. Solomon stared at the broken link and shook his head. If they weren't still silver, 
I would have pulled them off easily. But the spell of silver does not allow me to remove them without permission. He looked up at her. Thank you. No problem, she said, then watched as he ripped the shackles from around his wrist. The spell of silver now broken. Breathing a sigh of relief that he was finally free, Gilly grabbed the dev's hand and tugged him in the direction of sanctuary. Chapter 9 The village could have been found in almost any realm, so average did it appear to Gilly's eyes as they passed through the main gates. It was still early, but several of the town folk were awake and in the streets, going about their daily business. She was surprised to see so many fae among them. The impression she'd gotten of the place from Phaedra had made her think it was a lawless place full of villains. But so far, the village wouldn't be out of place in Valencia. So why does this pocket realm have such a bad reputation? I'm starving, Solomon told her, holding his grumbling belly. The Fay offered me food, but I thought it better not to accept their hospitality. Food it is, then a bed right after, she agreed pointing out a wooden sign hanging from a whitewashed brick building with charming blue shadows, she set off in its direction. The cup and candle looks like it fits the bill. The inn was clean and comfortable, a cozy fire burning in the hearth. Gilly could smell breakfast cooking and almost laughed when the dev pushed past her to hurry to the long counter across the room. Beyond the counter was a large open portion of the wall that created a window in the kitchen. A ready-checked older female with dark curls under her white cap needed a lump of dough. She looked up at their entry and smiled broadly. Welcome to the cup and candle. Care for hot breakfast? I do, Solomon said, pulling out a stool and perching on it. As much as you have on hand. This time Gilly did laugh. She took a seat next to him, some of the night's anxiety melting away in the warm welcome of the innkeeper. The woman abandoned her dough to heat plates full of sausage links, fluffy eggs, and grilled tomato halves. I owe you hot buttered biscuits as soon as they're out of the oven, she said as she set them on the counter in front of her guests. Solomon wasted no time digging in, letting out a moan of delight at first bite. For Gilly, exhaustion outweighed hunger, so she asked the woman if any rooms were available. Of course, she replied brightly. Most of the rooms upstairs are empty except for old man Gribble. If you run into him, he's a trifle deaf and a bit jumpy, but he's harmless. I'll get you a key after I finish with the biscuits. Gilly gave her a grateful smile, then picked up her fork. A bite of tomato was on its way to her mouth when she froze. The jerky motion knocked the tomato back to her plate, but he didn't notice. Stop eating, she hissed under her breath. We don't have any money to pay for this. Embarrassment flooded her, but Solomon didn't even pause. His plate was already more than half empty. Gilly slapped the fork away from his mouth, which finally got his attention. What in the blazes are you doing, woman? Maybe if we explain our situation, she'll let us sleep on a floor somewhere out of the way. I'll offer to do some dishes. You say you'll sweep floors or clean windows or something. Gilly wasn't eager to be tossed back out into the street now that she'd gotten a taste of the inn's comfortable furnishings. You've lost your mind, haven't you? The stress has finally broken you. Solomon looked sad for a moment, then picked up his fork to resume eating. "'What are you doing?' she whispered frantically. "'Didn't you hear me? We don't have any coin!' "'What are you talking about?' Solomon replied, around a mouthful of food, then flipped back his robe to reveal a velvet coin purse. "'I've got plenty of gold to fund us, but I'm not going to advertise it.' Gilly's eyes went. "'Are you telling me the Fae didn't relieve you of your purse at the same time they took your weapons?' Solomon shook his head. They didn't see the coins as a threat, I suppose. Maybe none of them can be bribed, or maybe they're all already so obscenely rich that they wouldn't waste the time it took to rob me. I don't know, but either way, have I answered your question? Can I return to what's left of my breakfast now? She nodded, ignoring his taunt tone and picking up her fork again. By the time the innkeeper appeared with a plate of biscuits, butter and jam, and a large bronze key... Gilly's plate was nearly as empty as Solomon's, who'd actually lifted it to his mouth to lick it clean. The room is up the stairs at the end of the hall. I've tried to place you far away from old man Gribble. He sometimes likes to shout at the pigeons in the street. What does he say to them? Gilly asked while her companion buttered his biscuit with gusto before popping it into his mouth. Mostly threats. 
They won't escape him again. Next time he'll snatch them up and roast them up for his dinner, things of that nature. The innkeeper pointed out the wide front window to a small square at the end of the street that was barely visible. He spends half the day feeding them down there, then makes a half-hearted lunch for one before he leaves in disappointment. How that old man thinks he'll ever be able to snatch up a pigeon is beyond me. He's harmless, like I said. Unless you're a slow pigeon, Gilly said with a wink, sending the older woman into a fit of giggles. How much do we owe you for the food and the room? Two gold ought to cover it, and I'll throw in dinner tonight as well. One gold and five silver, and we'll skip the dinner, Solomon countered, his biscuit having disappeared in record time. We may be busy elsewhere this evening. The innkeeper nodded and held out her hand. Solomon filled it with the requisite coin, then complimented her on her culinary skills. I haven't tasted anything so fine since my own mother passed. Thank you, she said with an inclination of her head. My patron will be pleased to hear that you liked it. He's always asking for reviews. Patron? Gilly asked, confused. What do you mean? Don't you own this inn? I do, but I owe my skill to the Dark Lord of the Sauce, as he prefers to be called. The innkeeper picked up the empty dishes and carried them back into the kitchen. She continued to talk to them through the window, explaining further. I made a pact with him. In exchange for his tutelage and a service performed for him here and there, at his choosing, he grants me his knowledge and access to some of his magic-infused recipes. The Dark Lord of Sauce, Solomon echoed, his face having lost some of its enthusiasm. You mean there was magic in the food we just ate? Not much, she replied. Just a little for seasoning. His most powerful recipes are not for the faint of heart. Fiends are fans of spice, you know, and his dishes sometimes have unintended and, at times, intended consequences. All of this is fascinating, Gilly said, seeing Solomon get upset at the mention she was the protege of a fiend with superior and sinister culinary skills. But I'm afraid we're a little tired out from our travels. Thanks for the food, she said, then raised the key. And the room. The innkeeper nodded, returning her attention to the task at hand. Gilly hooked an arm around the dev and dragged him toward the stairs. Did she say she's made a pact with a fiend who calls himself the Dark Lord of Sauce? You're hearing things, she told them when they started to climb. You're much too tired. Actually, I had a pretty decent sleep in my cell, he counted. Those fae know how to weave a good mattress. How nice for you, Gilly grumbled in reply. I spent the night scheming on how to bust you out of that place, and you were dreaming of fluffy clouds and kittens? I was dreaming, but that wasn't what my dreams were about, he told her, his voice becoming husky. Gilly didn't reply, hoping her flush wasn't visible. She knew he was alluding to their little interlude the other night when she'd inadvertently appeared in his dream. Better not to engage, she thought, as they reached the landing or I might never fall asleep. The room was cozy, perhaps too cozy in that there was only one bed. Too tired to argue about sharing it, Gilly hurried to pull the dark curtains over the window. I need to recharge or my powers will be useless later. Since you've already had a fabulous sleep, you can do as you please. Solomon crossed his arms over his broad chest. You know the rules. One of us keeps watch. He pulled the chair out from under a small desk and set it against the wall then pulled the curtain open a crack. Pleasant dreams, he said, over his shoulder, then followed it up with a chuckle. Ignoring him, Gilly collapsed onto the bed and turned away from the window, shutting her eyes and willing her mind to shut down. Thankfully, for once it obeyed, and moments later her fatigue claimed her, and she left consciousness behind. In her dream, Gilly found herself standing on a sand dune, watching five figures who stood in a circle below the dune, their cloaks whipping around them in the desert breeze. They were five men, no two of them alike, each seeming equally fierce. As she watched, she realized they stood on a hexagram that was glowing with a dull red light, each male on one of the star's points. But one point stood empty. Someone is missing, she thought, tucking her hair behind her ear and out of the wind's grip. Who's missing? All five men looked up at the sky in unison as if their attentions had been drawn by something Gilly couldn't see. 
She gasped suddenly when she realized one of the men's faces was familiar. That's Armon, one of the princes of darkness. She tried to recall what she knew about the princes of darkness, but little came to mind other than there were five of them. Why have they all gathered here? She asked herself. And where is here? She'd assumed she was back on Armon Abad, but the dream landscape was not exactly the same as the realm she'd experienced. Without warning, a flurry of whispers reached her ears, reminding her of the flapping of wings. She tried to make out what the whispers were saying, but she couldn't seem to understand any of the words. A raven let out a call as it flew past her, circling her as the whispers reached a crescendo. Without warning, all five men turned to look at her, their eyes hitting her like an electric shock. The dream dissolved as she woke up gasping. Solomon was beside her, in moments. Climbing in the bed, he enfolded her in his arms and brushed her hair away from her forehead. Go back to sleep, he said softly. I've got you. Soothed by his rough voice and the warmth of his skin, her eyes closed and she sank back into the abyss of sleep. Chapter 10 The tavern was crowded that night most of the tables full of drunken patrons with boisterous voices. It was a much different atmosphere than the quiet and cozy candle and cup. Gilly skirted past a broken mug and, in its accompanying puddle of ale, making her way toward the long wooden bar. "'Tread carefully,' Solomon whispered in her ear from behind. "'This realm is not what it seems.' "'He isn't just stating the obvious,' she thought, her eyes scanning the crowd for any signs of danger." From the vampire's mental manipulation to the discovery that their innkeeper, who had seemed charmingly quaint, was in league with a fiend to produce magic-flavored concoctions, Gilly didn't relish being caught off guard again. She found an empty space at the bar between a grizzled fay who had shaved half of his silver head and what she thought was a hill dwarf with bushy blonde eyebrows and a beard to match. Why do you think the innkeeper sent us here? she asked when Solomon had pulled up to the bar beside her. Do you think she had someone in mind for us to meet? If she didn't, she didn't say so. The dev hadn't been pleased when Gilly had confessed to the innkeeper that they were looking for a way off world. Their hostess had told her about the locations of several portals to Valencia, but when Gilly said they wanted to go somewhere else, she admitted that she knew of no way besides the assistance of a teleporter. Try the creaky table. It's across town. You might find someone there. She'd excused herself to finish up a cake, and Gilly and Solomon had departed in the direction of the creaky table, where they were currently standing. Gilly glanced from table to table, looking for any signs of someone who might possess an ability that allowed them to travel between realms. Unfortunately, finding one by sight was limiting. I don't see any demons, she muttered, knowing the horn type usually had the ability to teleport. They're not the only ones with useful powers, Solomon said while signaling the barkeep. We can't just go by what our eyes tell us. So you expect us to go down the line asking each person if they can get us out of the rough, she rolled her eyes. And you think these are the type of people to volunteer information like that without a cost attached? The crowd was a rougher sort and she saw plenty of swords strapped to backs and daggers shoved in boots. Solomon didn't bother to reply. Instead, he ordered two ales from the barkeep. Gilly turned to see a bearded gentleman with burly arms and ears that resembled those of a horse pouring ale into two mugs. He looked up at her and winked before passing Solomon the mugs. The dev tossed him a coin, which he caught in the air, then he tossed it up again to spin around and catch it on his long stallion-like tail. He flicked his tail, and the coin flew into the air and landed in his hand. Very impressive, Gilly said with a laugh, clapping lightly. When he winked at her again, she took it as an opportunity. Leaning over the bar and giving him a warm smile, she asked whether he would be willing to help a lady out. She felt Solomon bristle at her side when she asked the question, but ignored him. If flirting gets us where we are going, then I'm going to leaf and flirt. The barkeep leaned in on his elbow and looked her over. Depends on what the lady needs. By the look he gave her, he was hoping it was something that involved the pair of them in an intimate situation. That's enough, Solomon grumbled, and Gilly cocked an eyebrow at him in response. She turned her head back to the barkeep, her smile widening. We've just come from Valencia for a visit, 
And wouldn't you know it, my friend who was supposed to take us off world was called away. We're hoping to find someone who can take us off world. The barkeep cocked his head. There are the portals that go back to Valencia. They are free to use, well, most are at least. But you do end up in Valencia. His nose wrinkled comically on that line, and Gilly understood that he didn't have a high opinion of the Fey realm they'd just left. We're not headed to Valencia, she admitted. That's what makes this difficult. Batting her eyelashes at him, she smiled sweetly and raised her pitch to sound even more feminine. Can't you help me out? The dev beside her made a strangled sound, slamming down his mug on the counter and walking off. Gilly's eyes followed him to where a barmaid stood, balancing an empty tray on her palm. Then the barkeep drew her attention back. Let me give you some advice about the rough. Folks tend to mind their own business while they're here, and for good reason. It wouldn't be my place to point out someone with a special ability, if you know what I mean. If it's a matter of money, my friend will pay you, she said, indicating Solomon. When her eyes hit the dev again, they widened to find Solomon bending low to speak into the barmaid's ear. She was a buxom lass, and from that angle, he'd have a good view of her wares. That leaf and hypocrite, she thought, then turned back to the barkeep. How much would you like? You can catch more flies with honey than with coin, if you follow me, he said, ogling her openly. I get off in another hour. How about you and I go upstairs and discuss this further, then? Looks like your friend is otherwise occupied anyway. Okay, sure, Gilly said, not intending to follow up on the invitation at all. She drained her mug, then excused herself. Heading in the direction of Solomon and his barmaid, she felt her temper starting to rise. I'm not jealous, she told herself. I'm just angry because he's doing exactly what he didn't want me doing. The barmaid was blushing red and giggling like a child in the first winter's snow. Solomon was still whispering in her ear, but his hand moved to her bosom. That's it, Gilly rushed forward, grabbing the dev's arm just as he dropped a silver piece between the woman's breasts. What in the seventeen hells do you think you're doing, she growled at him. Just because I was flirting with the barkeep, you saw the need to take things to the next level? Is that it? I was just gathering information, he said innocently, then turned back to the barmaid, who eyed Gilly with suspicion. Thank you for that name, sweetheart, he told her, bending over to kiss the back of her hand. The barmaid giggled fiercely, then wandered off, looking back over her shoulder to give Solomon a seductive glance. Gathering information, Gillian mocked. What exactly did you learn? How many silver pieces could fit down her bodice? Someone's jealous, Solomon said mildly, arching a dark eyebrow at her. Unlike your efforts with that satyr behind the bar, I was actually able to get a name. And how do you know I didn't? Gilly said stiffly, blowing a burst of irritation air out of her nose. Because that type is much more practiced than an innocent like you. He wouldn't give up anything, but he'd have you give him everything. Gilly rolled her eyes, but she knew the dev was likely correct. She'd already proven to him that she was a terrible flirt, but when he'd turned the tables on her, she'd seen a side of Solomon that had driven her wild with desire. And he's just done the same thing to that barmaid. What name did you get? she asked, pushing down her envy in favor of making progress. Yako, he said, scanning the room for the owner of that name. Long black hair with a fluffy tail to match. Ah, he said, inclining his head in the direction of a male who matched those features. I think he's there. Gilly's gaze landed on a man sitting alone at a small table, drinking out of a tiny ceramic cup beside a ceramic bottle with strange markings on it. The man's hair was long and black, a shining cascade over his shoulders. His eyes were also black and almond-shaped, but his clothing was unfamiliar to her fey eyes. White sleeves poked from a dark grey sleeveless robe that was belted at the waist. She could see a hint of bushy black tail from under the table. Well, she asked, turning back to Solomon, who had yet to move in the creature's direction. Are we doing this or what? Perhaps not, he said, stroking his chin. That looks like a nogestoon. I've heard of this type. One supposedly came to Aramana Bad centuries ago and caused all sorts of trouble. A Naga what's it? 
she asked, studying the diminutive figure. He doesn't look like much. Nagastun? And looks can be deceiving. They are a race of known tricksters, lovers of mischief and mayhem. Dev give them all a wide berth. Well, we aren't going to get out of the rough unless we take risks, she told him. And this is the first line we've had on anyone who might be able to take us out of here. I say we talk to him. With that, she set off in the direction of the Nagistoon's table. He looked up at her approach, his expression one of curiosity. Without waiting for an invitation, Gilly took a seat at his table. Hello, she said, striking out a hand toward him. My name is Sagila of the Fay, but you can call me Gilly. Hello, Gilly, he said, taking her hand and shaking it once. And who is your towering friend? That's Solomon, and he warned me not to talk to you. This earned a baleful glance from the dev, but it made Yako laugh. But I told him you looked like you could be trusted. Did I make a good decision? Yako considered her words, lifting the tiny cup to his lips and drinking, then returning it to the table to refill it again. A fay without wings and a dev who's left his hell realm. My horoscope did say today was going to be interesting. Gilly noticed he didn't exactly answer her question, but that was okay. She'd taken a gamble and gone into it directly, hoping to catch his attention and keep it. Yes, yes, the old life versus dark thing. We've heard all about it. She waved her hands dramatically, then leaned in to say in a faux whisper, It really didn't go over too hot in Valencia. I can see why, Yako answered with a chuckle. But what I don't see is why the two of you have come to grace my table. What is it you think I can offer you? A ride off world, she said simply. Rumor has it that you're able to teleport. Rumor, eh? He said with a grin. In this instance, rumor is correct. And as I'm such a nice guy, I would be happy to assist you in getting out of the rough. But traveling here... You must know that nothing does anything for free. What do you want? Solomon's voice was as rough as gravel. I need a couple of skilled individuals for a heist I'm planning. You help, and we'll split the treasure three ways, and then I'll send you to whatever realm you like. What are you trying to steal? Gilly asked, her guard going up. Just a bubble of sentimental value, he said airily. It was taken off me, and I'm merely reclaiming what already belongs to me. And how do we know you'll hold up your end of the bargain? Solomon asked coldly. Can you even teleport, or is this all some sort of grift on your part? Yako looked at him, the corners of his lips twitching. Without warning, he made a high yipping noise like a fox in the forest. Gilly saw him snap his fingers, then suddenly she couldn't see Yako anymore. They were standing on a snowy hillside, overlooking a bamboo forest. She had time to watch a single fluffy flake of snow fall across her face before she was back at the table, only the hint of moisture on her cheek to prove that they'd ever been gone. "'Believe me now?' the Nagastoon asked with an amused expression. Solomon looked shaken, and Gilly realized— He'd likely never seen snow before. I believe you, she volunteered, taking Solomon's hand in her own to lend him some warmth. And are you in on my heist? Yes, she told the fox-like creature, provided you take us to where we want to go afterward. She held out her hand to him, and he shook it again, just once, before letting out a hearty laugh. What did I just get us into? Chapter 11. Gilly watched the pair of guards make their way around the parameter for a second time. For a sentimental bobble, they sure are keeping a close eye on it, she said wryly. They were stationed outside a heavily guarded stately mansion. In their short time crouching in the bushes across the street, she'd already counted a dozen guards. It isn't my bobble that they're guarding, Yako said in a casual tone. The owner has many treasures that are worth more than their weight in gold, but to find mine, we just need to make it to the vault on the lowest level. Wouldn't it be easier to barter with the owner, Solomon said, an expression of concern on his face. 
He might give it back to you if he knows what it means to you. He's not the giving type, Yako countered, frowning. But don't worry, it isn't consequential enough for him to come after us. And besides, you'll be far away after this, right? Why don't you use your powers to teleport inside, grab the thing, and teleport back out? Gilly wondered why he would risk going up against such numerous foes if the bubble in question wasn't worth much in the first place. There is a magical block against teleporting, he replied simply, his tail whipping around in an agitated fashion. We are wasting nights standing here debating, he said. Are you going to help me, or do we part company now? We'll help, Gilly replied, frowning at Solomon who looked like he was ready to call it quits. Good, he said with a pleased grin. We go when the next guard rotation heads around the corner. We'll climb to the garden wall and should be able to hit the ground and sneak to the portico in one of its doors. He paused, watching the guards, moving in tandem toward the corner of the garden wall. We go, now! Yako broke from the bushes and ran at a crouch straight for the garden wall. Gilly followed and Solomon brought up the rear. The Nagastun leaped forward and scrambled over the wall. Not exactly graceful, but quiet enough. Gilly made it over with a running jump and landed softly in the grass beyond. Solomon was right behind her, pulling himself over the wall and dropping silently to the ground next to her. They crept after the creature, Gilly watching his tail whip around as he crouched beside bushes and ducked behind trees to avoid being spotted. They made it to the portico easily, but when Yako started trying doors... He could find none that was unlocked. He let out a string of words in a foreign language that sounded like curses to her. This is unexpected, he admitted with a sheepish grin. I don't suppose either of you is proficient at picking locks. Gilly and Solomon looked at each other, then back at Yako. The dev moved forward toward the closest door and took the handle into his hand. With one hard yank, the handle came off in his hand, the locking mechanism along with it. Will this do? he said sarcastically. Yako patted him excitedly on the back. It will in a pinch. Let's go. The Nagastun led them into the darkened interior, whispering a warning. The owner is away, and he's been known to set up traps in his absence, so be careful of where you step and what you touch. Although it was dark and the dev's face was in shadow, Gilly knew he was rolling his eyes. She turned her attention back to Yako, who was getting his bearings in the room. I can see in the dark fair enough, he whispered. Follow me and step where I step. Gilly did as he suggested, and they set off across what appeared to be a sitting room. They skirted soft furnishings and tables holding expensive decor pieces. She watched her step, trying to avoid knocking anything over or setting off any of the traps Yako warned against. The Nagastun froze at the arched entryway into a dark hall. His head swiveled back and forth, making certain no guards were in the area. He started forward, but the dev put a hand on his shoulder, holding him back. Solomon pointed to the doorway above him, where Gilly could barely make out a metallic thread stretched across the space. His finger followed it down to the floor near Yako's feet. Trap, he whispered. The man's delicate features turned up in a grin. He nodded once, then carefully stepped over the tripwire. In the corridor, he skittered across the floor, leading them deeper into the house, tail bouncing behind him. Freezing suddenly and pressing himself against the wall, he motioned for them to do the same. Gilly heard footsteps in the distance heading in their direction. Solomon grabbed her arm and pulled her back into another dark room. They crouched there, waiting, until the footsteps diminished. Then they walked on, looking for Yako, who they found hard at work trying to disable another trap. This one, another tripwire near the floor. I've heard about this one, he told them, as he worked with a smile on his face. Greased slide. You hit this wire and the floor tilts downward, spilling us into a slide that lands us in a prison cell. Good thing you spotted it, Gilly whispered back, beginning to think they were in the company of a madman. Who could be having a good time doing this? This isn't the worst one, he said, snipping the wire in a way that didn't set off the trap. There is a hallway on the second floor filled with pressure plates. You hit one? and a pair of long swords come out from slits in the wall and cut you down. I heard there were no less than ten pairs of blades up there, so if you manage to miss the first pair, the next one will get you, or the next. And you think some bubble of sentimental value is worth risking all this? Solomon asked, anger evident in his tone. 
You have no idea, Yako answered. He crooked his arm for them to fall now that the trap was disabled. The stairs are right down here. Have you been here before? Gilly asked then, suspicion pricking her. You seem to know your way around. I've been gathering info, he said vaguely. I didn't want to risk coming inside and being blindsided, you know. Gilly did know, since they were forced to stop three more times to disable traps before they reached the stairs. And the stairs themselves were precarious, it seemed. Yako told them to step where he did exactly, or risk a poison needle springing from the floor underfoot. They finally made it to the bottom. But by then, Gilly had had her fill of the place. How much farther? she asked, annoyed. The vault is on this floor, just past a room full of guards. What? Gilly and Solomon in tandem. You've got to be kidding me, Adev followed up. And how exactly do you expect to defeat a room full of guards? That's the easy part, Yako said, then froze suddenly. Flattening himself to the wall, he made himself as small as he could. Gilly heard them then, the footsteps, and she latched onto Solomon and pulled him back into the shadows. Calling on her fey powers, she used her ability to blend the three of them into shadows. If she'd done it only for herself, it wouldn't take much thought. But three was a strain on her. And I wanted to save my magic in case we came up against anything we needed to fight. Like a room full of guards. At least she was able to keep everyone hidden while a guard walked right past them down the hall. When he was gone, she released Solomon and exhaled heavily. Yako looked at her as if reevaluating her abilities. Nicely done, he whispered, then waved them forward. Solomon, however, held her back. What are we doing? This is far too dangerous. We should go. Now, before that fox thing gets us killed. If we get this leafing bubble of his, he'll take us out of the rough, she reminded him. We've come this far. And it only takes one mistake to end up dead, he replied angrily. Salmon pointed down the hall at Yako. That creature's race is known for their deceit. He could be leading us into a trap of his own. He grabbed her arm and turned her. Let's get out of here while we can. Solomon, stop! She yanked her arm out of his grip. You do this all the time, insist that something terrible is going to happen, but we've yet to die, and we need his help to get out of here. Something terrible always happens, he replied, throwing his arms out in disgust, as if to emphasize the point. His arm accidentally made contact with a pressure plate situated in the wall. Gilly heard a series of clicks, then the whir of some kind of mechanics. The wall behind Solomon was suddenly closer, and the dev took a step forward, the color draining from his face. Badbaha, he muttered, shaking his head. I'm sorry, Mujisa. I'm an idiot. Come on, she said, sprinting forward to reach the end of the hallway before the walls closed in on them. Gilly was fast and Solomon even faster, but it would be a close thing. The dev reached the opening before her and wedged himself in, his arms trying to hold back the walls long enough for her to escape. She crouched under his arm and into the vestibule beyond, then turned back to him. Can you let go and die forward? Going to try, he grunted, then flung himself out the opening that clapped close behind him. Solomon panted, wide-eyed, sufficiently chastened to no longer try to retrace their steps. We need to find Yako, she hissed, then turned around to see the creature crouching there, his almond eyes watching them. Having a little fun without me, he asked, then chuckled softly. Come on, I've found the vault anteroom. Yako led them to a room where the torches blazed on the walls. The three of them stood on the threshold, considering. I thought you said this room was filled with guards, Solomon asked him. All I see are those stone statues. Exactly, Yako said. Another trap, Gilly said, looking down at the floor to find tiles in red and black alternating across the floor. Let me guess. Every one of those tiles is a pressure plate. You're getting it, Yako said with a laugh. Yes. At the first step, the two statues on either side of the first row activate. The next step, two more come to life, and so on. By the time you make it across the room, you've got a dozen stone men to contend with. Gilly looked the room over, not interested in a fight they couldn't win. I've got an idea. Crouching low, she closed her eyes and concentrated on drawing her magic. 
She knew she couldn't touch the ground lest a pressure plate go off, but if she did this right, they wouldn't have to touch the ground at all. She exhaled, her breath coming out cold enough to start a shear of ice growing from the outer walls in. Aiming her magic carefully, she created an ice shelf that hovered half an inch above the floor itself. Gilly blew out again and again, thickening the ice as the minutes stretched out. Finally, she straightened, nodding proudly at her work. Brilliant! Yako yipped, pulling her into an embrace. If you'd like to partner up after this, I think you and I would be able to pull off some amazing feats. Gilly smiled. Let's concentrate on pulling this one off first. I'll go first, Salmon said. If it holds me, it will hold each of you easily. The dev hesitated, his foot hovering over the floor. He stepped up onto the ice, one foot and then the other, and waited for the ice to crack and the pressure plates to initialize. Nothing happened. Gilly and Yako watched as Solomon made his way carefully across the ice. He paused at the archway leading into the room beyond and motioned for the next one to make the passing. Yako clambered up nimbly, his steps quick and light, and soon he was across. Then it was Gilly's turn. She wasn't worried, having seen Solomon cross with no danger. Her eyes took in the statues as she passed them and quickly noticed a trend. They were fey, ancient ones by the look of their haircuts. Each had two long braids reaching the waist of their chainmail tunics. Their pointed ears and ethereal beauty quickly gave them away. What exactly is this realm's connection to the Fae? she wondered, not for the first time. Leaping down lightly from the ice shelf, she followed the men as they made their way into the chamber beyond. A single torch burned on the other wall, and below it sat a chest with a large lock that winked in the firelight. Mine! Yako cried, rushing across the room without hesitation. Gilly winced, sure his actions would set off yet another secret trap, but the Nagastoon reached the chest without impediment. He clawed at the giant lock, then paused long enough to pull out a thin chain from around his neck. On it hung a small silver key. Yako drove the key into the lock with a yip of excitement. It opened, and he made short work of it, tossing the lock behind him. The chest creaked open, and Gilly hurried forward to see what treasure awaited them. She imagined a priceless artifact worth the perils they'd faced. Let's see what we'd risk life and limb for. Chapter 12 It's just a dusty old sack, Gilly cried, then covered her mouth, worried her volume might bring a guard down on them. Looking over her shoulder, she didn't see anyone coming for them across the sheet of ice. Turning back, she watched as Jaco snatched the bag from the chest and let the lid fall with a clang. We should go now. Yako turned on his heel and hurried toward the ice sheet, pulling himself up without waiting to see whether they would follow him. Gilly glanced at Solomon, who shrugged, then let out a sigh. Well, you wanted to leave earlier, so I guess you're getting what you want. The dev scowled at her words, then clambered up onto the ice sheet, following their companion. Gilly took up the rear, gliding across the ice effortlessly to catch up with her fellow thieves. What in the multi-worlds could be in that sack, she wondered. What could be worth all of this? Gilly wouldn't have knowingly suggested they tackle the trap-laden and god-stuffed mansion. Or would I? If it gets us out of the rough, then maybe. They made it back to the stairs in moments, and once again they followed Yako onto the steps in the required pattern, being careful not to set off another catastrophe. Carefully, they returned the way they'd come until they reached the sitting room with the broken lock. Yako paused on the threshold, peeking out the door to watch two guards march past. He waited for a couple of beats, then pushed the door open and skidded out into the garden. Crouching by the bush next to the garden wall, their companion pulled out the dusty sack and pawed at it anxiously. "'I can't wait any longer,' he mourned. Gilly watched him open the ties, his hand disappearing into the bag, only to reappear holding a small rectangular object. "'What is it?' Gilly asked, her heart beating harder. "'Maybe it's something magical. Maybe he'll share it with us. "'He did say he'd share any treasure with us. "'This must be virtually priceless.' "'You are looking at the most flavorful slice of fried tofu outside of, of Fukui,' he said, his tone full of reverence. "'Tofu?' she said, confused. Then the smell hit her, a pungent aroma that was unpleasant, but only mildly so. "'What is that?' "'It's food,' 
Simon realized, his tone confused. We risked our necks for food? Not just any food. This snack is irresistible to my kind. Yako grinned at them, pulling the tofu closer to take a huge sniff. His mouth dropped open, his pointy canines dripping with saliva. I can't wait any longer. I must have a taste. His tongue flicked out to lick at the tofu, his face a mask of ecstasy. He opened his jaws and tossed the tofu inside. Hole, then chomped down eagerly, making joyful sounds as he chewed. Why was a piece of food kept in a safe? Gilly asked, confused. Once the Nagastoon swallowed, he answered her question with a grin. A friend of mine and I had a bet. He did not think I would be able to claim the prize, but I knew that I could, and now I have. This was a bet? Anger hit her like a bolt of lightning. You sneaky little acorn thief! Gilly's hands were curled into fists at her side, and she had to hold herself back from tackling the laughing creature. The dev didn't bother holding himself back. He grabbed Yako by his robe and lifted him, shaking him in his fist. Transport us out of here, now! Take us to Gilly's home realm! Gilly glanced at him, eyes wide. He wants to come to my home? Excitement flared inside her. She knew it wouldn't be an easy introduction, but she hoped her family would accept him. Because I love him, and I don't want to leave him behind. Yako grinned, then licked his chops. He lifted his head, yipping loudly up at the moon. A blue light flashed suddenly, blinding her. Gilly blinked, and when she looked again at Yako, she realized the man was gone. Salmon let out a growl, dropping the robes. From the empty neck hole, a fox sprang. It shook its bushy black tail, then made another yip before bounding off into the garden and disappearing beneath the hedge. They looked at one another, surprised by this turn of events. Gilly was about to suggest going after the fox, but the sound of pounding feet heading in their direction changed her mind. Guards, headed this way, she called, taking a defensive stance as they rushed toward them through the bushes. That's it, Solomon growled, his temper having snapped. I've had about enough of this pussy footing around. It's time to let out some of this pent-up aggression. With a roar that shook the garden wall's foundation, he transformed, letting the monster inside him come out to play. Guards continued to spill out of the house, dozens and dozens, until Gilly wondered how the owner of the house could afford to employ so many. Then she realized many of them looked the same. A nondescript fame male, with the same long braids she'd seen on the statues upstairs. Magic, I should have known. Feeding off Solomon's anger, she drew on the well of power inside her, ready to let her temper reign. Your master likes to snare people in his traps, eh? Let's see how you like it. She knelt to bury her fingers in the dirt and grass, channeling her power into the ground around her. The vegetation around them began to shake, a wave of rustling shooting through the garden toward the house. Suddenly branches and vines sprang from the various bushes, flowering trees, and shrubbery surrounding them. The garden came to life around the guards, roots rolling out to trip them, vines wrapping around their limbs and pulling them into the brush to swallow them whole. While Gilly used the power of nature against them, Solomon relied on brute force, beating back waves of fey clones with his fists. They just keep coming, he shouted, picking one guard up and tossing him into three more, knocking them all to the ground. One falls and four more take his place. She could feel the dead's frustration. Although the garden was doing its best to devour the pesky guards, more spilled from the ornate house, like a plague of locusts come to devour the garden before it could devour them. Gilly stared at the house, peering in the windows, hoping to catch sight of whatever magic user was in control of the property and its servants. Her eyes froze when they landed on a small marble statue of an ancient fey warrior nestled in a small alcove on the second floor balcony. That thing looks just like they do. Inspiration hit her, and Gilly bounded toward the house, using her extreme athleticism to leap over guards and swing from trees until she was able to haul herself up on the balcony running along the second story of the mansion. "'Where are you going?' Solomon called out. Then she felt the impact when another guard slammed into the wall just below the balcony and slid down the stone of the house to tumble back to the ground. "'I'm testing out a theory,' she said, stopping in front of the statue. She picked it up, tracing the fine detail that was a miniature copy of the ones stationed outside the vault. Except this one was carved of an enormous sapphire. The gem should feel cool in my hand, 
but it's pulsing with heat. Gilly carried the statue to the balcony, waving at Solomon, who was busy driving the heads of two guards together with a meaty thud. She tossed the statue off the balcony. It shattered on the stone path below, its shards flashing before they vanished, taking the multitude of guards with them. Solomon blinked in surprise at his empty hands, then looked up at her and grinned. Smart thinking, Mujisa! Now climb back down here quickly! All the racket we made is sure to alert the neighbors that there is trouble afoot! Gilly hurried to join him, then followed him over the garden wall and into the alley that ran along the back of the mansion. Already she saw lamps lighting in the other homes on the street, and people tumbling out of open doors to see what manner of disturbance was in progress. "'There they are!' a woman with her hair up in elaborate ribbons to prep it for sleeping pointed at them, her eyes on the dev, a look of fear on her face. "'Come here!' Gilly said, pulling him back into the shadows and using her power to shield them from view. "'Stick to the darkness, and we'll find a way out of the city.' It was clear to her, given the commotion currently surrounding them, that they'd have trouble blending into the small village now that they'd been spotted. "'I don't have a great feeling about this,' Solomon whispered to her, as she smuggled them out of the city gate and into the court. "'There they are!' a woman with her hair up in elaborate ribbons to prep it for sleeping pointed at them, her eyes on the dev, a look of fear on her face. "'Come here,' Gilly said pulling him back into the shadows and using her power to shield them from view. Stick to the darkness and we'll find a way out of the city. It was clear to her, given the commotion currently surrounding them, that they'd have trouble blending into the small village now that they'd been spotted. I don't have a great feeling about this, Solomon whispered to her as she smuggled them out of the city gate and into the countryside around the city. We're leaving town in the dead of night and we know what lurks in the woods. What else can we do? Gilly asked. Yako screwed us over. Like I said he would. She could see that the dev was working up a full head of steam. Yet you never listen to me. Over and over you drag us into something you think will make things better. But they only end up worse. They'd reached the tree line and Gilly dropped her spell. Hit with a wave of exhaustion, she pushed it away to round on him. I'm sorry, okay? I'm trying to get us out of here. And yes, I might take risks, but what else can we do? Settle down here in the rough? Spend the rest of our lives avoiding fey operatives and growing more bitter and disillusioned with each other? Solomon stared at her. He opened his mouth to speak, then closed it again, shaking his head. I'm the one who should apologize. I know you're only trying to do what you think is best. Gilly sighed wearily, the fight gone out of her. She started off down the path that climbed a shallow ridge back out of the valley. They were retracing their steps, heading back into the same forest they'd traversed for hours yesterday without making any progress, thanks to the leech. At the thought of the vampire, her ears shivered. The feeling of being watched settled on her shoulders almost immediately. You're being paranoid, she told herself, focusing instead on her disappointment at being cheated by the Nagastoon. He transported us once. He could have done it again, especially after we helped him. Her eyes sought the stars burning above them. Tofu! Is this the direction we came from? Solomon asked, coming to a stop and pointing through the trees. This is the way the path goes, she answered tartly. What are you asking? He pressed a hand to his head. I'm feeling strange again. That was the only notice they got. The vampire stepped out of the forest and onto the path directly in front of them. I will have Holly. You will not evade me. Gilly's eyes widened. She was running empty on powers, having expended almost all her reserves on the fight in the garden and their escape afterward. Just like the night before, it was the worst time to face off against a vampire. Solomon, however, wasted no time transforming into his monstrous form. Towering above them both, he roared in the vamp's direction. The leech didn't even flinch. He glided forward, his eyes boring into her. I will not be denied. Where is the human holly? Tell me. She felt the creature's powers trying to invade her mind. Gilly resisted, but the pain was incredible. Solomon swung on the vamp, but he disappeared, reappearing closer to Gilly. Stop resisting me! His powers hit her again, and Gilly fell to her knees, letting out a cry of agony. Solomon growled in rage, leaping toward the leech, but the vampire raised his hand, stopping his momentum. 
Then he flicked his wrist, and Solomon sailed over the treetops, landing with a thud several yards away. "'Tell me!' the vampire said, having reached her side. His fangs flashed in the moonlight, and she watched him lick his lips in hunger. "'Tell me, or I'll drain you where you stand!' Gilly was crumbling under the pain. She held her tongue, but it became increasingly harder. She could feel him entering her mind, could feel him pawing through her memories. "'No! Stop!' She felt herself weakening. Falling back to the ground, she stared up at the stars, begging the multiverse for help. Suddenly, a blinding light flashed above her, and Gilly fell unconscious, tumbling into what felt like her death.